Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 34th meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. And for the people joining us on the panel today, you do not have to press any buttons on the console. It's all done for you by broadcasting. So just speak and it will happen. Uh, just like that. The first item on our agenda today is to hear evidence at stage one in relation to animals and wildlife penalties, protections and powers Scotland bill. The first panel focuses on wildlife crimes issues connected with the bill and I'm delighted to welcome, and I'll try and find them with my eyes as we go around, Ian Thompson, Head of Investigations for SPB Scotland. Karen Ramu, oh you're in the order, that's wonderful, Policy Advisor for Scottish Land and Estates. Ross Ewing, uh, pol political and Press Officer of Scotland, uh, British Association for Shooting and Conservation. R Dr Ruth Tingey, Raptor Ecologist for Raptor Persecution UK. Eddie Palmer, the Chairman of Scottish Badgers. Les George, Gamekeeper and Scottish Gamekeepers Association Committee Member for the Scottish Gamekeepers Association. And Liz Farrell, Wildlife, Link Wildlife Crime Subgroup Convener and Scottish Officer for bat, the BAT conversation. conversation. Bats Don't Converse, Conservation Trust. There we go. Hopefully that'll be the end of that nonsense today. Good morning to you all. Um, right, we're going to move to uh, questions. Now, it is a, is a panel, so if you um, we're not going to direct questions necessarily to each of you, so if you want to just um, answer on anything or give your point of view, just raise your, your, your hand in the air and we'll take a note and we'll get to you eventually um, as we discuss all the various themes in this. So I'm going to start off um, about the, the evidence base for increasing penalties for wildlife crime. So I want to ask about what the trends have been around wildlife crime and how the currently available penalties have been used in instances where um, those penalties have been considered insufficient. So if anyone wants to sort of come in and, and, and give us a, a view of, of what's been happening up to date, we're very grateful. Yes, Liz Farrell. Um, start by giving an example of um, the freshwater pearl mussel. Um, so there was an instance uh, on the River Lion, um, hydro scheme to service 600 homes and about 100, 100 years worth of damage they reckon was, was done, um, killing hundreds of the freshwater pearl mussels that are extremely, extremely endangered globally. And certainly there's um, an important population here, here in Scotland. Um, they reckon the basic repair um, to that catchment was almost a million, a million pounds, and yet they were fined um, four thousand pounds in in total. Um, and it's just um, kind of the deterrent is deterrent is not there. Um, similarly, with the Bat Conservation Trust, um, we most common offence for for us is to do with developers of kind of small, um, medium size. You know, bats aren't, um, uh, you know, factored in to, to projects and it leads to kind of corners, corners being cut. Um, there's instances uh, where licensed bat workers have made us aware um, that they've carried out surveys for developers and um, for then them to take the survey results of where they find bats, basically get rid of the evidence and get a different ecologist in to do another survey that then shows shows no bats. And the penalties for doing that are almost factored into the cost. Yeah, it's actually cheap. Yeah, yeah, well, even, you know, not even getting a survey done is cheaper, actually, for developers. You know, bat surveys, mitigation, you could run into ten, you know, £10,000 um, quite easily for, for bigger scale projects. And, you know, just some examples um, of, of the actual fines that they were getting, £900 for, for roost, roost destruction. Um, in Scotland, a senior employee at a lettings company consultancy, uh, 2014, blocked off a soprano pipistrelle roost with 500 bats in it uh, and was fined just £240. And that's not even a day rate for an ecologist to do a survey. Okay. Yes, Ian Thompson. I think one of the, the big 
biggest issues you've got with regard to wildlife crime and, and trying to establish trends in it, in that it's actually most crime is going on unseen, undetected. And if we're just looking at this annual body count, for example, we really have no idea what, how that represents what's actually going mm. on. What we're actually dealing with is, a, is a, a sample of unknown size. So when it comes to measuring the impact of criminality, it's much, actually much better to use things like population surveys, for example. So for, <clears throat> excuse me, for species like um, hen harrier, for example, the hen harrier population in Scotland has declined by something like 27 per cent between 2004 and 2016. There was the, the, the satellite tagging review commissioned by the Scottish Government a few years ago that showed a third of young tagged golden eagles were disappearing in suspicious uh, fashion in areas being managed for grouse shooting. But that's just tagged birds. I mean, if you extrapolate that into the actual number that are likely to be being illegally killed, you, you come to quite a staggering figure. Mm. But we have to accept that wildlife crime usually happens in places where it's not witnessed, and it's very easy for the individuals undertaking it to cover up the evidence. And they're obviously not going to leave a, a poison bird or a shot bird or whatever lying around for hill walkers or the police or whoever to, to stumble across. So we have to look at it very much in that context. Mm. Karen Rammer. Um, it's just to make the point that I think it's really important um, that we have present statistics to go off when we're assessing wildlife crime. I think it's been quite unhelpful that we've not had an annual wildlife report crime from the government in the last three years, I believe. I think the last one out was 2015. Um, also, the, the raptor maps that are often produced annually, they've not been released either. But I think when you look at the work that's been done by um, the pause group, um, I think you know we can say that we are seeing a reduction in most types of wildlife crime. Um, the, the main issue in terms of wildlife crime at the moment, which is still at high levels, is things like poaching and hair coursing, which are also linked to other crimes such as serious organised crimes, which you know have really serious impacts on rural communities. But I think that importance of having the up-to-date data to go off and be able to then target action is, is really, really crucial. But yet an increase in penalties might see that decrease further. So you, you have a situation, as, as Ian Thompson said, you can't actually exactly say the level of crime because it's very difficult to actually count, count them all, all the unseen, the unprosecuted crime that's happening. But these penalties might actually see an even further decrease. You accept that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. except they could act as, as a, a definite yeah. deterrent. Ross Ewing. I think uh, one of the important things to note is, as, as Ian points out, is that um, the number of wildlife crime that's been recorded in Scotland is a sample of what is actually going on for the reasons that Ian highlighted. And I think, um, you know, when you look at the actual figures in terms of the number, you know, from 255 incidents in 2013 and 14 down to uh, 231 in 2016 and 17, we are seeing a slight decrease in the overall number of wildlife crimes recorded. However, it is still happening at a fairly substantial level. So there is obviously a need to impose perhaps some more additional penalties, which my organisation supports, in order to bring that down further. But I'd also like to echo as well what Karen has said um, about the uh, hair coursing uh, and other kind of poaching type offences and use of hunting with dogs illegally. Um, we've seen in my office in particular a number of phone calls uh, about these kind of issues happening in places like Angus and the North East in particular. And actually that's reflected in the statistics. Um, you know, we've seen a, we've seen a sharp rise um, from 29 uh, hunting with dog offences in 2013-14 up to 42 in 2015-16. So this is a real issue for us and I think it's really important to highlight that this kind of crime is going on not necessarily the crime we always hear about but these kind of crimes are also just as important as incidents of, of raptor persecution and other crimes as well. Stuart you wanted to come in and then I'll uh, come back to other people. I, I really wanted to come back to what uh, Ian Thompson was saying and just to check and test because I what I heard and I may have misunderstood was that we would use surveys to establish levels of criminality. And I'm getting a nod. I'm very alarmed by that. I think it's perfectly proper to use surveys to provide intelligence. But that's different from measuring criminality because, of course, depletion of particular species, and I share the concern about raptors, by the way, so I'm not coming from any other position. Um, 
depletion of species isn't simply occurring because of crime. And, and, and I, I just give as an example, when I was a lad, there were lots of kestrels around. Now there are very few. And I don't think it's wildlife crime that's the problem. I, I think it's other factors. So I just wanted to be clear that you've got, in your mind, a distinction between using surveys as intelligence that says the number has gone down according to the survey, therefore we need to look for crimes and other causes. And I just wanted to make sure that that is something we were, we're going to agree on. Uh, no, absolutely. <coughs> Population surveys are your first level of evidence as to what is happening uh, to, sorry, that, to that. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to come straight back because I don't accept its evidence in the context of talking about wildlife crime. Is uh, it not intelligence? that leads you to the need to gather evidence rather than intrinsically being evidence in its own right. Well, what I was going to say is that the, the first layer of evidence in trying to understand what is happening to a population. So, for example, we have a, a survey of hen harriers carried out mm -hmm. in 2010, mm -hmm. a national survey uh, throughout the UK, another one carried out, and this is co-funded by the statutory nature conservation agencies in, in the four countries, another survey carried out in 2016. What that survey shows is a substantial decline in the population. If you consider that in the context of a pretty overwhelming weight of peer-reviewed science that looks for the reasons mm -hmm. that hen harriers are declining, where it establishes that targeted and deliberate persecution on grouse moors is one of the key drivers of the decline, then you start to build together a much clearer picture. And that's a much clearer picture than you're going to get from the fact that one dead harrier with shotgun pellets was found on, on but, a grouse but, moor. But do forgive me, and this is my final bit, convener, but do forgive me, the survey is telling you you need to go and look for the evidence. Yes, it's absolutely. not intrinsically evidence. No, but you have to consider everything That's fine. together. That's fine. As yeah. long as we share yeah. that viewpoint, yes, I'm quite content. I want to pick up on the you know, in answer to my initial question. Eddie Palmer, you've had your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I, th I think it's rather complacent to think that wildlife crime is going down at all. Um, what we're talking about is what's discovered and prosecuted, which are some different things. And actually, the government's own wildlife crime reports gave not a very um, uh, easy to read account um, because we, I'm talking about incidents where we know things have happened in this case to badger sets but for those to get uh, accepted and investigated as a crime and get to court is an extremely long and laborious process and rarely happens um, and the numbers coming to us and it could be as a charity we're having more reported to us by the public are going up and up each year and the jump for this year just gone 2019 is markedly over 2018, actually. Um, the, that, the, the various issues in this. Um, the, uh, yeah, what was, <laughs> what was I going to say? Um, the, to, as I said, to, to get a case of a damaged badger set to court is very difficult because uh, to, you, you know, give credence to what the police would say. Actual evidence is difficult. There might be evidence about your sets being dug out completely, but to find a perpetrator and to find evidence against them is extremely difficult. But you can't say that you're not having badger sets mm. dug out. That, that's the issue about that. Um, uh, in the case of actual, that's the trouble. We've got very few cases going to court over the last few years. And I think from the Crown Office, I'm trying to remember, I think we've had eight badger cases prosecuted in five years. Uh, that's as opposed to us having maybe 60 in, in, incidents a year that might be crimes. And, OK, the, you know, they're not all going to be classified as crimes. I accept that, but, that, but that's quite worrying. Uh, but to go back to the sort of figure that um, Liz was quoting earlier, um, and it's the only one I can think of from some time ago, um, a house developer uh, built a house too near a badger set up in the north of Scotland, um, having been told not to do it and breaking the licence conditions. And they were duly went to court and were fined £800 for that, which might seem quite a lot to people. But the extra house was sold for £300,000. Mm. And the, um, uh, the anecdotal things we pick up from people in development and the, the large people keep to the rules. So if we talk about um, more badger sets and badgers, you hear more about actual badger crime from SSPCA, I think. We rarely deal with it. Um, then... Um, 
Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I lost my, okay. lost my drift um, just there. Well, it's fair, I'm going to come to you and then, Colin, your line of questioning off the back of that. Yeah, just, just a really uh, brief point, um, just to say that Scottish Environment and Link do not believe that wildlife crime is um, decreasing in eddies, obviously, given figures specifically for, for badgers there. Um, and we've, we've obviously consistently uh, responded to the um, annual wildlife, Scottish Government annual wildlife crime report. Um, certainly for, for bats, we average about 139 cases each year, and that's not uh, showing any sort of sign um, of, of decrease. And, and um, again, picking up what Ian said, you know, likely lots of under-recording as well there. Remote okay. parts of Scotland. Colin. Thank you very much, and Good morning to the panel. Can, can I turn to the issue of how wildlife crimes have been categorised in the bill and, and really ask that the panel for your views on whether or not you think that the penalties and procedures proposed are uh, proportionate? Ross Ewing. So I think um, the really important thing to be mindful of here is, is there's essentially going to be two tiers of uh, wildlife crime kind of penalties introduced. Tier one, five years, no fine limit, and one year for lesser crimes and a 40k fine limit. And I think the important thing uh, when it comes to tier two in particular, this uh, one year and 40k fine limit, so this is for um, issues to do with um, uh, damage to habitats and um, nests and all these kind of things, is I think there needs to be a bit of due diligence exercised by the procurator fiscal in this regard. And I say this because you get different different kinds of uh, damage to nests, um, some are more severe than others, and I think there needs to be a little bit of um, common sense when you're actually trying to decide, okay, is this a tier one or tier two offence, as it were. So, you know, if someone goes and uh, burns a very huge, vast swathe of moorland and kills absolutely everything on it, um, you know, that is a damage to habitat uh, and would therefore be a a tier two offence, but actually the ramifications of that are so serious that actually would probably merit being a tier one offence. So I think. What I'm trying to say is it's not entirely clear at the moment. Um, there's different uh, levels of severeness uh, of each kind of wildlife crime. And I think uh, assigning them on the basis that, you know, tier one is if you kill an animal and tier two is if you destru destroy its nest, I'm not entirely sure if that is entirely workable. And I think there needs to be, as I say, a, a bit of kind of, you know, you've got to do a bit of due diligence to decide what's going on there. Nice, George. Yeah. I think the proposed five-year jail term is a game changer really um, from a gamekeeper's point of view um, most gamekeepers are not going to be able to pay 40k um, <clears throat> and it's not just a jail term for a gamekeeper you lose your job your house your living really you're not and you're never going to be a gamekeeper again if you're convicted um, you're not going to have firearms again, so you're you're out of the job altogether. That's a huge thing, you know. I I, I think it's a huge deterrent as, as far as. Yeah, Ken. Uh, yeah, just very much supporting what Les and and Ross have said. I think you know the penalties that have been proposed are huge deterrents. Um, going back to the point that Ross makes, I think I don't know if we'll touch upon it later on in the session, but things like using impact statements to assess the level of impact on um, different crimes and on, that, on what that means for different species um, should come into play as well um, in terms of the whole ecological impact um, that a certain wildlife crime could have on a certain population in a certain area. Um, but very much picking up on what Les said, I think, you know, the, the penalties as a whole act as a real deterrent and it's not just a case of a fine or a jail sentence, it's, it's potentially the end of somebody's career. So I think they are, Ethelie, are very supportive of the penalties that are being proposed. Suddenly you wanted to come in? Um, in terms of deterrent, is it not that the, the current legislation of penalties would potentially, if a gamekeeper got convicted, would he not lose, lose his job and the chance to be a gamekeeper in the future? So all we're actually talking about is whether a gamekeeper can afford 40,000 or a, a lesser fine. Are, are the, the penalties not severe enough now that a gamekeeper wouldn't be likely to, to retain his job or be employed as a gamekeeper in the future anyway? So is it really a deterrent? Well, I, I believe the five-year jail term means that the more people will be going to jail because of this than, than there was previously. So that obviously extrapolates out that more people are going to be out of a job, out of a house, 
no way of supporting a family, really. So, Ian Thompson. One of the issues has been that the maximum penalty is hardly ever um, imposed by the courts. I mean, we've had the ability of the courts for, for many, many years to um, impose a £5,000 fine and or a six-month custodial sentence for, for many of these offences. There has been one custodial penalty given to an individual for rap to persecution offences since the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act came in, in in Scotland. When that individual was convicted back at the beginning of 2015, we all thought that would be a game changer and rap to persecution would suddenly cease to be an issue and it just has not happened. We've had a recent case in the borders where an individual was convicted of multiple offences and I think those of us who were, or were closely involved in the case thought that surely on that occasion, given that the, the courts can impose that penalty for each offence, we were convinced that there was a very high chance of a custodial penalty in that case. But again, it was a community order that was, that was given. This is actually down to perhaps direction. Obviously, the courts are independent, but we just do not see these big penalties given. Usually, they are a, a mere fraction of what's available to them. Hence, the reason that some of these crimes have continued unabated for so long. Can I just ask, Les George, what a situation the gamekeepers feel under pressure to do things that might put them in breach of the law from their employer. What's your view on that? Does that... Uh, is that a no? I, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say that's the case. Um, so it's right that it's the gamekeeper themselves that's responsible, seen responsible, solely yeah, responsible for it. Everybody's responsible for their own actions. I mean, it, it, that's that's how it is. You know, if if you do the crime, you do the time. And it, and and the, the the landowner should be completely. Well, exonerated. we've got vicarious that, liability. Yeah. There's been a couple of cases where it's where we've had cases of that. Mm -hmm. um, that is a matter for the police to take forward. We're going to come to questions on that in a, in a wee while. Uh, Ruth Tingey. Uh, following up from what Ian was saying, um, in that the, the maximum sentence is, is rarely given, and of course that's a matter for the courts, but um, I think a, a bigger issue is it doesn't really matter what the penalty is. That's, that alone is not going to act as a deterrent. I think the risk of getting caught is far more important. Um, so if, if the criminal considers that the risk of getting caught is pretty slim, um, they're going to commit the crime because the risk is, is worth it. Um, so there needs to be a, a, a much bigger effort on the enforcement side. I'm not saying that's easy. We all know how difficult it is to investigate some of these crimes, particularly in, in remote areas. But the two have to go side by side. It's no good having one without the other. OK. Liz Farrell. Yeah, I just um, wanted to make the point that we don't think the bill, Scottish Environment Link, don't think the, the bill goes um, far enough in term, terms of protecting the, the habitats. Um, so we, we feel that more wildlife offences, um, for instance, involving raptors and, and badgers, should be um, triable either way than is currently suggested in, in, in the bill. Um, we welcome the fact that, that bats are receiving um, increased penalties in terms of upper courts as well with unlimited fines. Um, but it, it, we're, not, we're not seeing this consistency. You know, a bat shouldn't be more under law appear more important than a hen harrier. Um, and I'm sure others can come in on, on evidence why why um, badgers should, uh, their, you know, their resting places, breeding sites, should also receive um, more more protection. Um, Ross, you want to come in? And Karen, then I'm going to have to go to our next question. Yeah, I think um, the very important points raised around the room. Um, I noted in, on the actual question here um, paper, there's actually a point about pesticides. Um, and I just wanted to kind of make a note on that, that there is no legitimate reason to have these pesticides in Scotland. Um, and at the moment, I think it was the intention that it would probably be, uh, well, I don't know which tier of an offence it would apply to be, but I would, I'd be minded to say that should be a tier one offence because there is no need at all to have these pesticides in, in Scotland, there are just there's no there's no requirement for it. Um, you know, south of the border, it's a different different case. But 
uh, up here, um, that is, they're just they're, they're no requirement to have them. So, so that I think, would be evidence enough. Well, indeed, in I would. Uh, that's my argument uh, on this one. I think there's just no need to have illegal pesticides, and um, as, as such, they should be um, they should bear the full brunt of the law as a result. Thank you. Karen Ramu, and then I'll move on to questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I mean, it's just to pick up on the point that fully agree that um, penalties alone will not act as a deterrent. It is about sort of um, the education about around wildlife crime, the impact that it can have, and it's about awareness of the possible maximum penalties um, that, that could come along if you do commit wildlife crime. And I think more training and support for police to assist with detection are really important. But I think it's really important that a consistent approach is taken to tackling wildlife crime, and that will help act in itself as a deterrent as well. So it's, I guess, going back to the point that maybe Ian made was that, you know, when, when kind of um, a case is brought to court and it's shown that somebody has committed something, it's showing that they do feel the full brunt of the force of the law. Okay. Mark, would you like to ask So some the bill obviously deals with uh, custodial sentences and fines, but I'm wondering um, how effective other sanctions have been, for example, suspension of general licenses uh, on estates, uh, or, you know, community payback orders, I think that's already been mentioned and seen as perhaps not an effective route. Um, but are there any thoughts around the table on um, how the kind of suite of other sanctions that are available have, have worked or not in terms of deterring wildlife crime? Ruth Tengi. I think uh, the general licence restriction is a really interesting case. Um, there have only been four uh, maybe five since this came into force. Um, and what we've seen is um, once the general licence has been removed, the estate can simply apply for an individual licence to carry out the same act of, uh, of killing so-called pest birds, um, just under slightly more scrutiny from SNH. just means they've got a bit more paperwork to do. Um, it's not really a sanction at all. And has that happened for those... Those examples where a general licence has been withdrawn. Um, I know on uh, two estates um, they have applied for an individual licence, and on one of those estates um, they got the individual licence, and then further offences or alleged offences were uncovered, and the individual licence was also removed from the estate pending an investigation by the police. I don't know how far right. that's gone, but clearly the general licence restriction uh, wasn't a deterrent. Mm -hmm. Ian? I think, following on from what Ruth's saying, it strikes me that uh, it's, it's a tortuous process, the imposition of a general licence restriction, and in actual fact, this uh, time delays from offences being confirmed uh, by the police investigations on land holdings to the point where a general licence restriction is actually imposed is, is currently taking years and years to do. I would agree that it is hardly seems like a penalty, um, the restriction of general licences. In fact, some could argue that it's actually a, a does not benefit biodiversity, because I think it's widely acknowledged that some control of generalist predators, like corvids, for example, can be of conservation benefit. And if you're removing that ability, then that potentially is penalising the wildlife on, in the area as much as it is the, the, the managers of, of, of the estate where the offences have been committed. It strikes me it would be much more um, effective sanction to actually remove the motivation for committing these crimes which are invariably to benefit grouse shooting. If you removed the right to shoot grouse for a year or a couple of years, I think that would be much more robust and effective. Ross, you. I would disagree actually with Ruth and Ian on the effectiveness of, of, of the restriction of general licences. It's important not to underestimate the pivotal role that general licences play on shooting estates in Scotland. It is an integral part of what estates do. And actually removing uh, under a general licence, if you restrict it, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to carry out that function. Now, Ruth has alluded to obviously the application for individual licence. There are a litany of species under which individual licences would need to be applied for. And moreover, actually having this restriction against your name as an estate is going to reflect very, very badly on you. And it, actually, it's publicly available online. Um, and I know of a number of people that probably would not visit that estate purely on the basis that they know that wildlife crime is probably being committed there. The other thing to note about the restriction of general licences 
is that it takes place under the civil burden of proof. There's no need to surpass the criminal burden as there would be otherwise. And that's actually a really useful tool. And perhaps if these uh, restrictions, um, you know, they, at the moment the police uh, and SNH meet every three months, um, perhaps if there was more regular meetings between these two organisations to review more regularly, that might result in a few more restrictions being put in place. Uh, and as a result, that might be even further um, a bit more of a deterrent uh, in that respect. Stuart, Stuart, you wanted to ask around... No, no. Oh, sorry, are you bringing me in fixed penalty notice? Yeah, but yeah. if... if, if yeah. I'll bring you in a minute. Whether the, the, the general licence restriction then had actually impacted on those businesses that, 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 had, that had faced that? Absolutely. I mean, is, are, are they, have they gone bust now? Or? So, uh, actually, Jack Basque have done a bit of research into this, and we've actually uh, we've done a big survey to find out exactly what the financial implications of removing general licences might be right. on people. And it does show, our survey, which went out to, I think we had about 900 respondents, showed that there would be financial implications if people were not able to use general licences in an effective way. So, that shows that there, if you restrict it, that there is going to be implications for people, and uh, you can't get away from that point. The problem we've got, however, is A, the timescale it takes to impose them, and B, certainly, I think Ruth alluded to the fact that one, one of the five impositions that has happened uh, alleged wildlife crimes continue to be carried out, so, which suggests to me that this is not a particularly effective penalty. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I agree with some of you're saying, um, Ross, and I think the fact that it is a civil burden of proof is very important, given the, the challenges that I think we all acknowledge exist in investigating wildlife crime and particularly getting a sufficiency of admissible evidence to um, undertake a criminal prosecution. But I just don't believe thus far that even the threat of a general licence restriction is causing these wildlife crime to stop. The, 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 the statistics, such as they are, don't support that. I'm going to bring in Stuart Stevenson. There's a question on the proposal of fixed penalty notices for wildlife crime. Yeah, the fixed penalty notices are more to the point the power to bring regulations forwards to create fixed penalty notices um, is right at the top of the boat, section two, so it's obviously quite an important part of it. Uh, and I suppose it's the opposite end of the scale. It's introducing um, a way of penalising offenders for minor issues. Uh, and I suppose the question is, are we satisfied that uh, these will be used appropriately? Um, now, I ask that question and I go back to that uh, the regulations will give us the detail and we don't currently have that. But as a matter of principle, do we think they're a good thing to discourage people at the bottom end of offending from establishing a career of offending. Liz Farrell. Thank you. Yeah, um, Scottish Environment Link don't, don't have an objection to them at all, and, and they certainly have had their place, but we, we would like to see some, some clear guidance um, produced as well, um, just to set kind of clear, clear limits and, and to kind of have that assurance that you know, they won't be used when the severity of the crime means that it should be um, prosecu prosecution is, is the most appropriate action. Any other views on that? Karen Rummer? Um, yeah, I mean, I solely don't have any objection to fixed penalty notices. We don't have much experience with them, so uh, we don't fully understand how they would work on the ground. But in principle, we feel that they would be a good approach to dealing with those minor um, crimes. We also, like Scottish Environment Link, feel that clear guidance would be really useful if they were to be um, used. And also, um, just sort of a, I guess a minor point, but I mean, fixed penalty notices are used elsewhere in society, and it would be good to have um, a better understanding of their use and um, the effects in terms of repeat offences once they have been used as well. So maybe a bit more work around that would be helpful. OK. I mean, we want, you wanted to pick up an impact, the yeah, impact, I, I Mark. Think, I mean, I think that's already been mentioned. Yeah. I'm struck by the examples of the badgers and the freshwater pearl mussel, but are there any views on about whether these impact statements currently are being used effectively? Do they need to be put onto more of a legislative footing at all? I've had no experience about that, but they would be useful because, um, just to point out, with badgers having a semi-permanent home, if that home is, is wrecked or damaged, the, the clan tends to break up and they, they disappear. It stops becoming a breeding set. So it has an extremely large impact <coughs> on that. And because partly because of the lack of court appearances and prosecutions, that hasn't been played out in court at all. Okay. 
Um, Ian, and then I'll come to Karen. I think certainly in our experience, when there has been prosecutions and impact statements are used, it certainly assists the prosecution. I, I think the Crown Office are probably better pleased to to answer directly, but but certainly something that we are really keen to see is the the conservation impact of a crime being recognised in the in the court as part of the sort of um, sentencing um, guidance. Okay, Karen. Uh, yeah, absolutely fully support the use of impact assessments. Um, in fact, we'd like to see them used more systematically, um, maybe a bit more monitoring around how frequently they are used, and we would have no objections to them being considered to be included in the Act. We think they are a really welcomed approach. Okay, Les George. Uh, are we not already using these already? So why? Why are we going down this route if they're already being used? And, the, and the, you know, why why are we legislating for 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 it if it's already being used? Okay. Seems a pointless exercise, really. Liz Farrell. Um, so they aren't being consistently <coughs> consistently used um, each time. And, and to give an, an example of that, um, a developer pleaded guilty to six charges of destruction of of. Um, a, you know, six different bat roosts um, destroyed, and his total fine was just over £300. And as I said previously about the actual costs of doing bat surveys are, are way above that. Where uh, an impact statement was used, OK, not for an absolute like-for-like -like case, but where an impact statement was used for another um, bat crime that went through, through court, um, they were fined £7,500. What is a significant difference? And certainly the Pousty Review... Um, sheriffs and pros prosecutor fiscals said that that it was actually helpful having an impact statement they found it useful before they gave the sentence to get a bit of background as, as ian said about actual conservation effect what what does the killing of one or a pair of hen harriers mean you know in a in a wider context yeah. uh, we're going to move on to questions about vicarious liability from colin smith I mean, Les obviously touched on the issue of vicarious liability earlier, so I'm keen to hear the views of the panel on uh, how effectively the existing provisions are being used and whether or not they should be extended to other wildlife crimes. Anyone want to? Yes, Liz Fennell. So, Scottish Environment Link do support, um, obviously, any measures that help tackle wildlife crime and we would like to see it, um, it extend, potentially extended um, wider to other, other wildlife species. Um, but there is, there is a bit of variance between members of um, Scottish Environment Link. Um, certainly from a bat point of view, actually we're not arguing for vicarious um, liability. Um, we, don't, we don't really have, have an argument for it. We, it. Prosecuting companies about fences is a lot easier than prosecuting companies such as, you know, dealing with raptor persecution. Um, it's the link between the company and the activity when it comes to developers and bat crimes is, is a lot easier to demonstrate. But I know that obviously um, RSPB do have had issues with this. Um, so maybe they can come in uh, too on that. I'll come to Ruth Pinkett and then Ian. I think uh, there's a huge amount of frustration in terms of um, how ineffectively vicarious liability has been applied in raptor persecution cases. I think since the legislation became available, there's only been two uh, successful prosecutions. There have been a number of cases where vicarious liability could have been applied, um, but wasn't, um, and an awful lot of secrecy about why vicarious liability wasn't applied. So, um, for example, when I've asked the Crown Office for an explanation in a particular case, um, or SNH, um, I've been told that it's not in the public interest to explain that decision, um, which makes no sense to me at all. Okay. Ian Thompson. I think when vicarious liability was brought in um, as part of the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, beginning of 2012, and in the lead up to it, it did have an immediate positive effect, in our opinion, because what we saw was, uh, and while I'm, I'm nervous about talking about trains and wildlife crime, as, as I mentioned earlier on, there was a very clear 
turn away from the use of illegal poisons, which I think everybody welcomed. It's actually difficult to disaggregate the impact of vicarious liability with the impact of increasing use of satellite transmitters on birds of prey, because satellite transmitters also made poisoning much more detectable. But I think the fact that vicarious liability came in at round about the same time led to a pretty significant deterrent effect. That, however, is now wearing off because, as has been said, there's only been a couple of vicarious liability prosecutions. I think the challenges are, first of all, the identification of who is potentially vicariously liable is very difficult, given the complexities of land ownership and identifying who actually uh, owns land is challenging. And I think also the fact that Prosecutions themselves are very rare, of, of, of gamekeepers, for example. And the fact that the, the Crown Office seems to, and again, they can confirm this, they seem to need a successful prosecution of a gamekeeper in order to then prosecute a landowner makes it a, a big challenge as well, even though the legislation doesn't actually see that's a necessity. Uh, that seems to, be, seems to be the case, but they can probably clarify that later. Okay. Ross Ewing. I think the position, I'd, I'd agree with some of what uh, Ian has said there, uh, particularly about the uh, initial impact of vicarious liability. We'd actually argue that um, uh, states continue to feel uh, the burden of vicarious liability, and as a result, they, uh, you know, they've very much sharpened up their act, making sure that all the correct administrative procedures are in place. And we actually feel it's been a really strong deterrent against wildlife crime, which has led to, as Ian's pointed out, the uh, reduction in uh, poisoning offences, for example. Um, so we as an organisation feel that it has been very effective. We feel that landowners are complying with what it's set out to do and as we've heard earlier you know it's very much um it's the individual gamekeepers um if there's gamekeepers involved in it or anyone else that's committing the wildlife crime it's the responsibility of the individual who's, who's really kind of uh, taking it forward because we're making sure that on estates that they're from top to bottom there is a zero tolerance policy for wildlife crime through this vicarious liability legislation and we've seen that on the ground from our organization's perspective Kevin. I mean, just, just very much echoing what Ross has said there, that, you know, SLE very much feel that vicarious liability has played a really important um, part in improving systems on the states. And I think one of um, the reviews, um, one of the points made in the Pooster report was that vicarious liability has made landowners more aware of their responsibilities. So it very much is playing a, a part in the, in the bigger picture of things. Stuart, you wanted to come in with a question. Uh, to come back to, to uh, Ruth uh, uh, Tingey about the secrecy issue. And vicarious liability is about the owner, the manager, um, having a system of oversight and taking responsibility for what goes on and having a scheme to prevent it and enforcing and using that. And I just wondered whether it was proper, in Ruth Tingey's opinion, that many of the specific measures a manager might put in place would be compromised if they were disclosed. And I say, for example, that there might be a scheme whereby uh, cameras are installed at particular points of risk by the owner in an attempt to detect that there are activities. And, that we, and it would be in, not in the interests of the owner of the enforcement of a scheme, or indeed of wildlife, if the details were to be disclosed. So therefore, while I'm not inviting Dr Ruth to say that in, in general, the whole scheme should be disclosed, there is a proper place for secrecy of how the vicarious, how mo owners and managers attempt to discharge their responsibilities. Brilliant, if landowners were installing cameras, um, that would save us a lot of trouble. Um, I don't think that's happening widely, but it, that's besides uh, the do point. Do forgive me, I was only, as, an, as a lay person, <laughs> seeking to identify an example. I don't think it was meant to be an exhaustive list of actions that sure. might be taken. I get, I get your point, but I think, um, I think you're right in, in that some landowners won't want to reveal the measures that they're taking, and, and why should they? They don't, they don't need to do that. But I'm talking about um, the secrecy around the decision-making. I mean, there's, there's a, a perfectly uh, apt defence to vicarious liability um, challenge. So if the landowner can show that he, he or she has shown 
all due diligence, which is what legislation requires, then all the Crown Office has to say in a public statement is uh, we've, we've investigated and we've found that the landowner has undertaken full due, due diligence, and that would be acceptable. You'd, you'd accept that, but we don't even get that. We don't even know if, if the case has been investigated at all. It's just a complete down with the shutter. We're not telling you anything at all. Okay. Um, Eddie Palmer? I, I think maybe some more guidance about precarious liability would be useful because I had uh, something that happened a couple of years ago. There was a clear line between an agent to a farmer to a forestry contractor. Forestry contractor totally wrecked a badger set. The licence was never on site. Um, they were all blaming each other about it. And I don't know whether the police or the Crown Office decided, you know, it wasn't worth going ahead. But the evidence appeared to be very clear in that case. Les George. I think you'd be very careful rolling vicarious liability out to other sections. We fear it would have a detrimental effect on fox control. Um, if farmers thought that they had someone in killing the foxes on their ground, if they thought they were in any way responsible for that person killing the foxes, they may stop fox control, which would be very bad for waders and crown nesting birds. And, uh, you know, the farmers probably wouldn't take the risk. They would just say, we're going to stop that. And that would be a really bad thing to happen. OK. Ian? If it was limited to, say, things like protected species like uh, otter, pine marten, badger, for example, that, that wouldn't be an issue. Because foxes are permissible species to, to kill anyway. But if vicarious liability provisions were extended to cover protection of those other species as mentioned, then that wouldn't be an issue. An issue. Presumably you would want to do it for fox snaring. Snaring is an issue, you know, that you, you love. I mean, it, if you're going to snare things, you will have bycatch. You release it, but it's a it's a risk for the farmer. You know, it is a risk for the farmer. Okay, Colin, I'm going to come back to you. Yeah, yeah. Karen, Karen mentioned the the, the poster review, and, and obviously that's the basis of much of what's in the bill in relation to uh, penalties for wildlife crime. But I wonder if the panel's got any views on whether there are any other recommendations in the review um, that could be addressed in this bill. Would anyone like to come in there? Ross Ewing. Um, I seem to recall there was a point mentioned about uh, firearm and shotgun restrictions. Um, so at the moment, firearm and shotgun certificates um, can be restricted. This is, happens under legislation governed by Westminster if there's a threat to public safety. Um, but uh, it might be a prudent deterrent, um, and this would be something that we need to work with uh, colleagues down south on. But um, if we were to bring in some kind of legislation whereby uh, you could revoke uh, shotgun or farm certificates if instances of wildlife crime were known to be taking place by that individual. And I think that would be a very prudent deterrent indeed. As um, has been mentioned already, it's very difficult for anyone who's committed wildlife crime to go get a job, especially if they work in conservation like gamekeepers do. But adding that additional level of actually revoking a shotgun or firearm certificate would probably be a very sensible thing to do on top of that. Because in my mind, if someone is committing wildlife crime, it's a very, it's a, it's a very bad thing. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I would argue that, that could be a threat to public safety at some point. You know, it's, yeah. um, where's George? Uh, to be fair, this is already happening. It, as soon as there's a case brought, the police take the firearms away from whoever's in the in the loop. So it's already happening. And they're denied a, a shotgun license in the future. Not in the future, but until they're proven innocent or guilty. Rachel. Uh, Paisley also recommended some um, intervention uh, training and, uh, well, empathy training. And I just wondered if the panel believed that, I, know, I currently know that there's no resource for that, but whether um, there had been a community payback order, that that should be part of it as well. Yes, Karen Ramu. So, yeah, I was going to pick up on that in my points. Um, Esley would be very supportive of, of that coming through. Um, we believe that where there's custodial sentences, um, that you could maybe include some retraining or empathy courses. I guess, trying to look as an example elsewhere, but if you think about when you get a speeding penalty, for example, you kind of go on an awareness course. And I think it's that whole thing of um, 
teaching or educating people um, about the wrongdoing and, and trying to right that as well. And one of the other things, um, if I may just touch upon in terms of recommendations from the PUSA report was um, obviously a more systematic approach to the use of impact assessments, but also um, that there would be merit in developing sentencing guidelines, guidelines to enhance consistency and transparency of wildlife crime sentencing. So that's something that we would really push for as well. Okay. We'll move on to some questions from Finlay Carson. Thank you. So we've heard in principle the idea of, of increasing the penalties. It, 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 most people seem to be in support of that. <clears throat> but there's very little point in increasing penalties if we're not increasing the number of people who are convicted. It's a bit like increasing the, the fine for speeding in a rural area if there's one policeman covering a hundred miles and uh, you're like unlikely to get caught. So I, I want to, to look at the scope for expanding uh, investigations and enforcement. Uh, and one of the implications might be an increase in the stats at a time uh, allowed um, for, uh, for looking at evidence gathering. And again, it's been broadly welcome, but uh, we don't know if there's actually any evidence that there's not. There's been cases that have failed because of the time limits in, in terms of gathering evidence. So I'd like the, the panel's opinion on uh, looking at changing the static time limits for investigations into wildlife crime. Would anyone like to come in? Yep, Ian. Um, I can't think of <coughs> many cases wrapped to persecution investigations that a suspect, if a suspect is going to be identified, it is normally within the first two to three weeks of an investigation. Raptor persecution, by and large, is happening in places where potential suspects um, um, are, are likely to be known, i.e. there is a narrow group of people who are likely to be responsible. And unless a sufficiency of evidence is found very early on in the investigation, it's not going to happen, whatever appeals for information there are publicly or not. It's very much down to the police and the Crown Office as to how much of an administrative time they require in order to, in order to sort of proceed a case. But in terms of the practical on-the-ground investigation, um, I don't think this is going to have any impact on that. Uh, Eddie. Just, say, just possibly, certainly, cases we say incidents that might be deemed as crimes um, can uh, run on for a long time, not unusual to nine, 12 months before hearing about anything. I mean, I know the, the trouble that some police officers have to get people for interview to arrange <coughs> that and then deal with their own leave and things like that. Um, I say I can't prove it, you know, and Ian might well be right, but um, it, it's something to be wary about, I think. I think there, there are resource problems at times. Ross? Just to touch on the kind of issues that I've uh, spoken about, about hair coursing and things like that already, it's inherently <coughs> difficult to catch the individuals that are undertaking such activity. And what we generally seem to find is they tend to be repeat offenders. Uh, and actually allowing a little bit more time so you can get a, a, a multitude of uh, offences against an individual it could actually be quite advantageous um, in those scenarios. So, um, yeah, with reference to hair coursing, I think it could be a, quite a, a positive step. Kevin? Um, just to make the point that we're unaware where there's been instances where um, a time limit has impacted on, on prosecution. And I think it's, it's separating out um, that sort of um, the time limit, you know, is that kind of causing problems in terms of taking things forward in terms of evidence collecting and then getting to that prosecution level? Or is it more of a resource and issue in terms of police? And I think it's really important to separate those two things out. And if it's a resource and issue, that we're looking at, then that should be dealt elsewhere. Finley? OK, thanks. Uh, I wanted to look at the, the other potential impact that a, a five-year custodial uh, penalty would allow some wildlife crimes to be treated as a serious crime, and that would open the, the door to allow uh, police officers to install covert cameras. Uh, and that, but it would still be in generally based on a case-by-case -case basis. But can I get the general feeling about uh, installation of covert, ca covert cameras and whether that might have a, a, a positive impact on the way the police can identify uh, the criminals. Um, fully supportive of enabling <coughs> the police to use um, and manage surveillance cameras um, under, of course, the strict RISPA um, regulation of investigation powers, Scotland um, procedures. Um, and we feel that actually 
where there's an indication <coughs> that wildlife crime might be happening, um, then there's a really strong case to use cameras and they could very much act as a real deterrent and hopefully lead to more prosecutions if wildlife crime is taking place. Liz. Well, I said Liz, but I'll go for oh, Liz sorry, sorry. and then I'll take Liz. <laughs> Liz, on you go. Um, don't have a problem with the police using covert cameras, but I think it needs to be handled quite sensitively. Um, I've got some personal things with this. I had cameras pointed at my house. It uh, was reported to the police. Police had nothing to do with it. It was other individuals. Uh, my wife, my child were filmed. Um, will it encourage vigilante camera users if they think that it's OK to do this? Uh, if the police are doing it, perfectly fine, but it will encourage others to do illegal camera work. Liz? Yeah, just a, a quite a, a, a brief point, really, just that we don't really, as environ, Scottish Environment Link, we don't have an informed opinion on this area, but again, anything that helps to, to increase prosecutions um, is welcome. So just on, on, on Leslie's point, at the moment, the police have uh, they've got to meet an information threshold before they consider the installation of uh, video surveillance. If that threshold was to be reduced and the police were more inclined to install cameras, that may... Uh, stop the, 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 the need for vigilante groups, as you put them, installing cameras. Do you think it might have an impact in that way? I don't think that will help. No. I think it will encourage people to go out on their own and film other people when they shouldn't be doing it. Ross Ewing and then <coughs> to Ian. Yeah, uh, as with what everyone said so far, we are broadly supportive, the ASC, very, very supportive of this. Um, I would echo uh, the sentiments have been made already, though, uh, about the kind of privacy issues that go on there. Um, it, it is a contentious issue, use of um, cameras, and I'm not entirely uh, convinced that some of the kind of camera work that has happened thus far to date by uh, non-police uh, or non-statutory bodies has been, um, you know, particularly sensitive. So I think there'd be a fundamental requirement for it to be uh, a sensitive um, process um, that's carried out with much due diligence in order to make it workable. But absolutely, um, I think, uh, you know, we see a small number of these offences referred to the procurator to fiscal and it would be good to see more and absolutely this kind of thing would help with that. Ian? Um, RSPB Scotland has on occasion deployed cameras in the countryside focused on things like um, traps or nest sites and some of the video footage that we have captured has been deemed inadmissible in prosecutions and on other occasions it has been deemed admissible. Um, we had a, a case that occurred back in, I think it was 2013, um, that ultimately the decision was made by the Crown Office that they couldn't rely on the evidence we'd captured, which was of an individual allegedly shooting a hen harrier off a nest. Um, the, the Crown made the decision that they couldn't rely on that evidence as part of a prosecution. Now, explanations for that are very much for the, for the Crown Office. But one has to ask the question is, is a, a camera pointing at a hen harrier's nest site, a schedule one species that nobody should be going anywhere near without a license, is that actually surveillance or is it monitoring a nest? And I think we have to be quite careful about how this is taken forward because are the police being, is it suggested that police are going to put cameras at nest sites just to monitor a pair of birds on the off chance that somebody might come along and do something bad? Now, given there are, what, 460 pairs of hen harriers in Scotland, I very much doubt that the police have the resource to do that. So there is absolutely a place, I think, for cameras to be deployed by other agencies if they are not imposing on people's Article 8 right to privacy under the European Convention of Human Rights. I think that the, the situation that Les outlined is completely unacceptable. Um, that is crossing a line, absolutely, if, if people's dwellings are be, or, and family are being filmed. But I think putting a camera at a nest is an entirely different proposition. OK, we're going to move on to questions from Rachel Hamilton. I'd just like to um, ask the panel if there are any further issues that need to be addressed in combination um, with the um, maximum uh, penalties. For example, um, resourcing um, enforcement 
or uh, raising awareness of those increased penalties um, in order for the purpose of the bill to actually deter uh, wildlife crimes. Liz? Certainly, Scottish Environment Link members would be very happy um, to, to be sitting uh, around the table and, and being part of that awareness raising. Um, I think it's all of our duties um, to do that, and certainly members um, Back Conservation Trust, RSVP, Scottish Badgers, and, and others would be happy um, to help get that, that word that word out for sure. Um, we have in the past with previous um, link responses um, put our opinion across that, that there needs to be more resourcing um, for police um, to, to if you know if we're gonna do this properly, you know, the actual implementation is obviously extremely important. We can change the law and, and increase penalties, but um, there needs to be that factored in as well. For other panellists want to give their view on this? No? Mark, you had a question. Um, yeah, I wanted to just get a reflection from the panel about the, the powers of the SSPCA. Um, I mean, the SSPCA obviously have powers already in relation to, um, to domestic animals, but that doesn't apply to wildlife. And perhaps alongside that, any reflections on the special constables pilot that's been running in the Cairngorms to try and tackle wildlife crime, whether whether you think that's been an effective way forward or whether SSPCA powers would um, would perhaps be um, a useful addition to the powers that the police already have. Okay, this is the last question from a member, so now's your chance, uh, panellists, before we wind up. Ruth Tingi. I think uh, the special constable project in the Cairngorms National Park has been a complete disaster. Uh, from, from what we know so far. We're still waiting for uh, a formal report, but what we know from parliamentary question from Mark, actually, um, is that no wildlife crimes were reported by those special constables during the period that the project was running, even though we know that wildlife crimes did take place in the park during that time. So in terms of effectiveness, um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to be measured by the Scottish Government, but in terms of um, reporting crimes, uh, there's nothing to report. Okay. And no one else has indicated that. Eddie? Sorry, it's about the SSPCA. I was just yep. going to make a comment. Um, the SSPCA are the okay. organisation that are um, managing to get some badger baiters into court because of their um, concentration on dog fighting. Um, and uh, from the point of view of Scottish Badgers, we sit between the police doing one thing and SSPCA doing a lot of work on the ground. I know that the police are very cooperative with SSPCA when they have to enter houses, for example, things like that. But the, both the data about that and the stats are, are mixed and confused, and we get caught in the middle at times. It, it's a very unsatisfactory situation at the moment. Liz George. Yeah. I, I, I think there's no need to give the SSPCA more powers. Uh, there's obviously a case in Angus at the moment where, that has been brought and to me they, they worked perfectly fine and I think if you're going to do these things, resource the police. They're an impartial thing. The other groups are not impartial and have their own agenda for things and I think the police have the police need to handle this, not, not other organisations. Ian? At the moment, the, the SSPC have the ability, they're a special supporting agency, they can report crimes under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, but legislation only allows them to enter land under the terms of the Animal Health and Welfare Act. In other words, if an animal is actively suffering what that basically means, or certainly our interpretation of this, is if a bird has been caught in an illegal pole trap and reported to the SSPCA, they can go and seize that trap and that bird. They are not allowed, however, to look to see if there are other identical pole traps or dead animals caught in those traps in the same area. We had a case a few years ago where a common gull was caught in a, a tra an illegal trap that had been set on a grouse moor in Aberdeenshire. There was a line of 10 of these traps set across the hill that the suspect was able to remove before the police were able to visit. But the SSPCA, had he been 
the powers to search could have recovered further evidence and we feel that it's important that the ID is at least explored. Okay, we have actually run out of time, but because I'm a nice person, I'm going to let my deputy convener come in with one Thank very you. short question. Uh, it's, it's very much in what we're talking about. You know, it, it seems that the SSPCA already have uh, powers in respect of animal welfare, why they shouldn't have equi equivalent powers when it comes to wildlife. Um, but there were, we've heard concerns that, uh, about accountability uh, of other organisations other than the police. Is, is there any, anybody got concerns about the, the governance or the accountability of other organisations like SSPC when it comes to additional powers uh, to enforce uh, and gather evidence uh, under this new uh, legislation? Ruth Tenge. I don't have any concerns at all. They're, they're uh, an, an official reporting agency. They do a brilliant job with domestic, domestic animals why wouldn't they do the same with wildlife? Okay. On that note, we are going to round up. Um, we are going to suspend briefly to allow for a change in witnesses.
We continue with hearing evidence at stage one in relation to the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Power Scotland Bill. Um, our second round table forces on enforcement and prosecution issues in the bill. I am delighted to welcome Mike Flynn, the Chief Superintendent of the SSPCA, uh, Detective Chief Superintendent Gary Cunningham, Specialist Crime Division of the Police Scotland, uh, Constable Char Charlie Everett, Scottish Investi Support o Investigative Support Officer at the UK National Wildlife Crime Unit, Robbie Kernahan, Head of Wildlife Management at Scottish Natural Heritage, Joanne Fairman, the Head of Regulatory Affairs of Animal and Plant Health Agency, and Sarah Shaw, the Head of Wildlife and Environmental Crime Unit for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Good morning to you all. Um, so I asked the, the uh, I'm not, I know that a number of you were in the gallery in the uh, when panel one were being uh, given the opportunity to, to, to give their evidence. I asked about the evidence base for the proposed increases to penalties in the bill and trends in, in uh, animal welfare offences and sort of instances. Obviously, we'll be talking about historic stuff, not anything ongoing. Uh, for reasons that I know that you all understand. So would any of you like to, to, to kick off with like what you think the trends have been or and the need for the increased penalties? And yes, Mike. Um, just a couple of recent examples. I know the sentencing guidelines recommend against sentences under 12 months, and we've had two sheriffs actually jailing somebody for nine months and 10 months respectively, both commenting that they didn't think their powers were enough. Um, so they felt it was serious enough um, that to go take that measure. So that kind of flexibility being given to sheriffs is really something that you think that there is a real yeah, desire I th for? I think the sheriffs would welcome it. You've got to remember, you, you make a five year maximum, it's still entirely up to the sheriff, whether to give six weeks or um, two and a half years or whatever. There's a lot of the people that we have dealt with that do not see a six month um, prison sentence as a deterrent. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people that we've dealt with in the dog fighting arena and the puppy fighting arena have been jailed many, many times for other things. It's an occupational hazard. And when you look at the puppy um, farming aspect, six months in jail, coming back out and you've still got the £20,000 you made that month, it's not a big deterrent. Right. Stuart, you wanted to come in. Um, it, it was just a little thing in relation to this. Isn't it also an issue for the Crown Office insofar as um, the, the, the larger sentences can only be imposed if it's brought forward as a solemn case rather than a summary case. So therefore, it's not simply a matter of the sheriff not having the powers. It goes back to the prosecutor as well, making sure that they are bringing forward cases as solemn so that they can be ultimately uh, resulting in long sentences. And maybe bring in Sarah Shaw to talk on behalf of the Crown Office. Each case is obviously considered on its own facts and circumstances and it has to be assessed as to what the appropriate forum would be um, when prosecution is being considered. So, so yes, um, you're right, um, in order to uh, open up the maximum penalties uh, to the court, there would need to be a, a solemn prosecution. <coughs> uh, but, but even although the bill introduces the potential for that power, um, it, we, would, we would consider each case um, and proceedings in the appropriate forum according to, to the, the particular circumstances of the case. Mm. And there is, I mean, you mentioned organised crime. So in terms of, of the offences that have been committed, this is part of a much bigger enterprise where an individual might go to jail for a certain period of time, but there's a larger organisation behind them. Certainly is. I mean, there, there's lots of documented cases on that, especially in the dog fighting and uh, puppy trade industry. Any other one? Yes, Robbie Kern. Um, just from our point of view, the opportunity to improve consistency um, of wildlife and welfare offences can only be a, a good thing, really increasing penalties for those most serious crimes is the clear rationale for this bill. So introducing flexibility and options for tailored solutions to each case, to me, makes perfect sense. OK. Joanne Fairman. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd just like to um, sort of second that, because whilst we're the regulator for um, a lot of the welfare, because the enforcement is done by our enforcement partners, 
you have to remember that the sort of the the point where we get to a prosecution and looking for the sentencing is at the end of all the other interventions that have been put in place we, you know that we build up to a prosecution it's not the end game so the fact that if we've got to the point where we feel prosecution is required actually the ability to have the bigger sentences because it means these are the people that we genuinely need to get out of the business or change their behaviour um, with a stiff sentence. Um, therefore, I think we've shown that the behaviours haven't changed over the last five or ten years with what we've got, so we need to do something different to deter those people that will not abide in any other way. And uh, the other part of my question was about trends in crimes and um, animal welfare crimes and kind of like how that's looking. You know, we're we looking at an increase in... Has there been increases... Over the piece, sir, yes. I think that's a very difficult question to answer because if you look at the statistics, you could say from the last year we're 30.9% decrease in wildlife crime. And I think a detection rate's about a 6 7% decrease as well. But just following up, I don't think we're cited enough on the actual volume of crime that's out there. This is only what we're, we're actually detecting as such or coming across. And if you look at the raptor disappearances, we can't actually sometimes prove that they're crimes. You can suspect there's criminality there, but to work through to actually prove them to the Scottish Crime Recording Standards, then record them as a crime, we're not there yet. So when you look at the volume of crime, I don't think we should be making decisions on the, what's, what's the kind of trends for percentages over the year compared to past year. I think we fully need to try and understand what problem we have across the board of wildlife crime, and that will come through better intelligence, better partnership working, mm -hmm. uh, better assessment of our response to the initial instance, and then we can maybe get a flavour of where the real issues lie, because if you look across the board, raptor crime is still the main, or wildlife crime but, uh, was the main issue that we're facing just now. And I suppose volume is not, not the most important thing. I mean, what, one instance is enough, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, I was coming to Rachel first, and then Stuart Stevenson, so... Well, the Law Society um, of Scotland made the point that um, there needs to be a clear rationale for justifying the differentiation in varying um, penalties. And I wondered if the panel could comment on how that actually could be much clearer in terms of uh, the, the varying penalties for the varying levels of crime in order for that to be clear. I, Mike. I think she has to take all that into account. The fiscal certainly takes into account when they're marking a case up, the severity of it, the, the impact it's had on the animals or the people. Um, and then it's down to the evidence that's presented in front of the court to allow the sheriff. One, I, I do know where it has fallen down, uh, and it's, it's more on the financial side, is the puppy, the puppy trade. Um, one accused who was found guilty uh, was fined £2,600 uh, for his involvement in that and £500 for selling in a public place. He openly said in court he had made over £1.2 million in uh, a year and a half. Now, that, where's the, where's the um, deterrent in that? Because his whole motive was profit. There was no animal welfare interest whatsoever. Um, so I think that kind of thing has to be taken into account as well. But the courts, given the right evidence, and the fiscal service do a fantastic job presenting that evidence to the court, here is why it deserves a, a, a higher penalty. You've got that on the profit side. Overall, our case numbers being reported to the fiscal are dropping year on year because we're doing more intervention and getting in, in sooner. Uh, still, the majority is basically ignorance and neglect, but we're seeing far more um, intentional cruelty uh, coming to light. We've had more recent badger incidents um, come to light, and that's because as soon as you start getting involved in these people, their cohorts and colleagues become aware to uh, you become aware of, and you can get evidence on them as well. So we're seeing some really serious one. The, the Cuthbert case, uh, who got 10 months in jail, that is one of the most barbaric cases I've, I've ever come across. Fraudulently getting cats free to good home from people and then feeding them to his dogs. Um, that's the kind of depravity we're dealing with these days. Charlie Everett. Yeah, um, I think the Crown Office will be able to exercise discretion with regards to, shall we take the killing of a wild bird, um, whether it's going to be so we say at one end a blue tit, another end a golden eagle. And also impact statements will also highlight the conservation concerns around the respective victim species, which will again help to differentiate the severity that needs to apply to those, to those species. Okay. Um, I'll 
Jerome Fairman and then Stuart, if you don't mind, I'll take um, Jerome I, I would first. just like to say the same. I think in the evidence that we put forward, there is certainly from <coughs> what we see in our perspective, there are the ones that are intentionally out to make money regardless of the welfare, whether it's the fighting dogs importing puppies. They are intentionally in it for the profit. The other side we see is more the on-farm welfare. Um, and I, and I, that is the real difference in my mind, because more often than not, the people that get themselves into problems with on-farm welfare it's usually they've declined in health, financials, and they've not set out to do it. They've found themselves in that position, and all of a sudden they, they can't see a way out of it, and it gets very entrenched at that point. And those ones are more difficult, because whilst it can be very serious and the animals can be harmed, there's been no intent to get to that point. It's just whether they take the right interventions when they're sort of suggested to them to get themselves out of that position and I think that in my mind is the distinction in terms of um, where, where the sort of fault mm -hmm. lies. That you may have, have a situation intent. where an, a, a person that's not coping might have issues that are outside. Yes. The, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. Stuart. Um, I just wanted briefly to go back to DCS Cunningham and it's an operational question uh, just whether uh, you're getting enough intelligence to populate your general intelligence resources uh, from all the many agencies and uh, and uh, charities that are involved in this particular area and if not is there anything could reasonably be done apart from perhaps saying that your doors are open to getting more of it it's a good question and a great point because i am I'm a great believer that we don't have that intelligence sharing protocol in place between all the different agencies, partners that are involved in wildlife crime. Scotland Police Scotland have a large database, as do some of the other agencies, and I just don't think we're at that level of sharing information. And that intelligence picture is going to be greatly enhanced and allow us to focus on where the real issues are throughout Scotland and then build cases to actually have some interventions or initiatives or operations focused on these areas. So don't get me wrong, the partnerships are strong. We're, we're continuing to build them. Everyone has a clear focus and direction as to the ultimate goal we all want to achieve, which is to prevent wildlife crime and catch those responsible. But I do think there are opportunities for a better information sharing, intelligence sharing, which will then allow us to assess the risk better, assess the problem better and target it. And economic criminals like puppy farmers, of course, that's likely to be part of a more general Beha criminal behaviour that these individuals are likely to be involved in. So therefore, even wildlife intelligence that's coming to you, or welfare intelligence that's coming to you, may have payoffs in other parts of the criminal justice system. Serious and organised crime, exactly. Uh, just to picking up on that, I mean, what do you think the solution is that? Is that an, an IT solution? Is that a resource solu uh, solution that you, you, you see, I mean, about getting this better information sharing? I think it's just to continue in the, the kind of partnership work and have these conversations, sit down, and how can we assess where we can get the information that may assist in joint operations? And it's work ongoing, but I, I don't really have the answer as to what is the solution. But you're right, there needs to be that, these conversations. Maybe set up a short life working group to assess which is the best way forward. So if we've got intelligence on some individual or some crime, then can we go down to partners and have that have these meetings? I think they have with Scottish National Heritage. Information sharing protocols are in place. How can we build on that to the other partners? OK, great. It, it sort of follows on from that and, and, and Mike, your comments on puppy farming. Uh, is there scope within the bill or does there need to be amendments to the bill which could further address uh, the drivers for animal welfare offences? Uh, you know, that might cover proceeds of crime. Uh, it may include uh, opportunities to, to sentences which include uh, educating offenders or actually preventing other offending or preventing offending in the first place. So is there, is there anything that the bill could do, we could do more uh, to address the, the drivers for, for animal cruelty? I'm not sure if I'm giving the right answer to you, um, but just back to Mr Stevenson's point as well, when it comes to the puppy farming, the police have been fantastic with the serious and organised crime squad, who I know are pursuing proceeds of crime uh, with some of the individuals who we've dealt with, and the interve interventions units have been very, very helpful. So on the domestic side, there is, there's a great link-up at a local level. Yeah, we'll also have a disruptions unit that are set up to come in and work with closely with the partnerships as well. OK, so there's nothing within out with the bill that we could include which would uh, increase the ability to address the, the drivers? 
you're quite content with it. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, I want to look at the effectiveness of other types of penalty at the moment. So um, th there's, there's suggestions that we need more flexibility, but also we heard evidence that uh, disqualification orders are a bit random um, and they could be used a bit more systematically. Uh, also, uh, we've, we, we've seen uh, disqualification orders or, or dog control orders which uh, haven't worked particularly well. So is there, is there need for a register of disqual disqualification orders uh, and other information about convicted uh, or, or people convicted of wildlife, uh, wildlife offences to help support enforcement? Joanne, you're nodding. So, yes, going back to the intelligence point, um, we've all begun to sort of um, dip our toes in the intelligence. We've got intelligence, we've got the FSS, we're working at the Gartosh, so we are doing it, but it's only as good as the information that goes into it. And it does come, as I say, there's no magic bullet, but it does come down to resources because all of us are given our funding to do the job that we're asked to do. And sometimes it's quite difficult then for the staff to take their blinkers off and look at the wider picture. So I think there is sort of potential to have some more strategic threats that cover sort of across departments that that might make it easier then to share the information. But back to the point of having disqualification is something that's literally come up recently with our, within our own area of APHA, is having the ability to know who has that got that disqualification order. And we, we do get it from some of the local authorities and we do get it from the SSPCA, but to have it in one place, to have that as a good source of intelligence, um, it's a good starting point then to, to, when you're looking at somebody, to think, right, well, should they have it? And the difficulty we have with disqualification orders previously is you might disqualify the one individual, but they then pass on the animals to a family member, somebody that's supposedly in the... So you're not actually solving the problem. Um, so I think there is something we need to for consistency and strengthening up that disqualification in terms of what it means and, uh, and to stop actually that it just continuing but in a different name. Any other panellists, Mike? Disqualification orders are regularly breached. Um, on our side with the domestic animals, every year in life we will get a warning from the RSPC, somebody that's banned in Manchester has moved up our way and vice versa. Um, there is no enforcement, there is no follow-up. It's your ban for five years or ten years and nobody checks on it. There's no central register. It, is, it will be somewhere deep in the, the depths of the PNC system, but any um, police constable coming at my door for whatever reason will know that I'm I've got a warrant out for me, I'm potentially violent. It'll not say I'm banned from keeping dogs. So you can walk mm -hmm. into my house and I've got five dogs there. Uh, nobody knows about it. We've spoken for a long time about getting a register that authorised agencies can access um, without any uh, risk to the individuals. It's also helpful for the public as well. So, for example, if you're going somewhere to purchase a pet and, you, and, and if you know that there's a register, you can check... Register. I think the last time it was talked about it was whether it should just be for enforcement agencies or open because uh -huh. you could get vigilantes trying to find out who's banned and well, see, trouble. Yeah, because that was mentioned in the panel last yeah. week is that the, one of our panellists says, well, in the past, things within the newspaper um, around this, kind of, so they, they were actually asking for the public, publicly available. Uh, register, but you're saying that I might actually have unintended consequences. Well, it could for that aspect, but I mean, I'm, I'm going back seven, eight years. A local authority gave a pet shop license to a person who hadn't declared he had been banned. If you're banned from keeping animals, you're automatically you will not get a pet shop license. He didn't declare it, and they had no record of it, so they issued a pet shop license okay. through no fault of their own. Yeah. Stuart, you wanted to come in? Uh, it will come to fixed point notices a little later, but at, at just at this point, would it be appropriate to make sure the fixed, point, it, fixed penalty notices are also part of the register system so that uh, the existence of a pattern of low-level behaviour is available at the appropriate point? <coughs> uh, it may be a question that answers itself. For the uh, it's, it's a very good point. We, our bit on fixed penalty notices, it should never apply to where an animal suffered. It should be all the tiny technical offences, of which there are thousands, and offences that if a local authority, APHA, wanted to go to the prosecution, would the prosecution take it? A livestock caller not cleaning his wagon out in between uh, modes, I think if you put that to the procurator fiscal, no animal had suffered, the chances there, that would be an ideal one for fixed penalty notices. But we've consistently said you shouldn't be getting a fixed penalty notice for the same thing every week. So we'll come back to FPMs. I'm just on the narrow issue of putting them on a 
register. Yeah. Okay, um, Mark, you have some questions for our panel. Yeah, um, uh, I think you know, the panelists have already started to explore the area of, of linkage between violent crime and, and animal welfare offences. Um, I'm just wondering if, there, if, there's, if there's other approaches to, um, to, to prevention um, and enforcement that could be pursued here. I mean, the, the committee heard, I think it was last week, that in some countries, um, you know, social work uh, offences can be reported, incidents of suspected animal abuse can be reported to social workers, for example. And I'm just wondering how this area is evolving. A lot, a lot of it goes back. Um, there is the links group, which was set up, and it involves basically all partners. And it's to um, back to um, the police point of view. It's information sharing under proper protocols, um, and it's to get professions. I mean, it's even uh, linked into like dentists uh, spotting domestic violence and all that kind of stuff. Who they should report it, should report it into the police and all that kind of stuff. So it is more about information sharing where it's appropriate about that in terms of the information sharing between different agencies at all. Anyone want to come in? Um, I would say no, not if it comes down to child welfare, adult protection. Yeah. I think we've got that level of confidence that's automatically shared. And I think we have to have that, again, mindset when you're going to deal with wildlife crime. If what, what is the individual's mental state if they're capable of carrying out some of these acts? So should we consider the wider piece of work with our health professionals to get proper assessments done, to look at the wider family dynamics? I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. To, to wildlife crime specifically, I mean, Scottish Natural Heritage and Police Scotland have got a very good relationship in terms of making sure all of our relevant information and intelligence, whether it's on the impact <coughs> populations or specific individuals, is, is fairly well developed. There is also a recognition that at the Partnership Against Wildlife Crime, we've got specific groups set up to look at specific topics. But because of the ongoing polarised debate about land use and raptor persecution specifically, some of the intelligence sharing protocols, some of the media protocols, because of the lack of trust, don't work as well as they should. Okay, um, can I... I think if, we, if we're done with that, there's no more, no more comments on that. Um, can I just move on to how the um, bill might impact on decision making by the Crown Office and, and the PF? Sarah? Do you mean in terms of the extended uh, time yeah. period for, for or just investigation? The, all the provisions within the bill, really, how, how you see it Im impacting on your decision making? The Crown Office, will, Crown Office of Brugge to Fiscal Service will continue to consider reports of all cases um, received um, and will consider uh, whether there's a, a crime being committed, whether there's sufficient admissible evidence uh, of that crime and whether there's uh, evidence of um, the perpetrator uh, and whether proceedings are in the public interest. Uh, and we'll, we'll, take we'll continue to take decisions on the same, in the same basis as we do currently. Uh, obviously, with the um, factors that can affect wildlife crime, the detection in terms of um, where the crimes take place and in terms of there can be delay sometimes in, some t in terms of the, the crime coming to light. Uh, there can also be um, complexities in terms of uh, pursuing uh, forensic evidence and examination of items. Uh, and I think that the uh, time period um, within which a prosecution can be brought, um, th th that, that will be useful where, where the, um, there is a delay in detecting a crime or where there is um, a complexity to the evidence. Mm -hmm. Does the increase in sentencing options affect the public interest test about whether to pursue a case or not? The, the penalties don't affect the public interest test directly. What's the option of... Um, opening up the potential to prosecute either at summary or solemn level does is allows the Crown to take full account of all the facts and circumstances of a case and to um, take account of the seriousness of the offending, um, the circumstances of the offender, the alleged offender, and to be able to ensure that the forum in which a prosecution is brought uh, reflects the um, seriousness of the offending. And obviously we can take into... We will, in, in considering the forum, have an eye to the potential outcome and um, 
the, in, the proposed increase in maximum penalties um, obviously allows um, offending at the more serious end were that to be appropriate for, for <coughs> solemn level it opens up those those maximum penalties as an option mm -hmm. for the court mm -hmm. okay and do you think that the the increase in maximum penalties uh, requires new sentencing guidelines I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to to, to comment um, on sentencing as such mm -hmm. um, uh, I am aware that uh, the, the Scottish Sentencing Council um, are uh, we're considering uh, guidelines on wildlife and environmental offences. Um, as I understand it, those are still possibly in progress. Yeah, I, I don't know if there are any other views on that. I mean, we, you know, we had the discussion earlier on about impact statements, for example, and you know the, the severity of a crime and the wider impact. Does that require reconsideration of sentencing guidelines? Any thoughts on that? I think from our point of view, um, that kind of recommendations is included in the event of the report that would be displayed to the court anyway, the severity that's the impact it's had on that individual animal. Um, and then when it gets to the puppy side of things, I'm sure the police are evaluating uh, if they're going for proceeds of crime, uh, the, the, the money that's been made from that activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? How common is it to... Um to be able to use intelligence to link organised crime and um, puppy farming and, for example, domestic abuse and um, uh, animal cruelty? If intelligence is there, I mean, it's just a case of making sure we have sufficient intelligence getting brought into our systems to make that assessment. But to, to make the link between puppy farming and organised crime, um, it's really quite simple. It depends just on the individuals you kind of research, look at the financial gain, the setups, linking into other police forces who will then share their intelligence. So it's quite easily done. And then you can draw the picture on the individuals, their motives, um, how they are towards other people. And that brings them in domestic violence. And I don't know if that answers your, your question. But it does. It kind of links into the severity um, of the uh, uh, penalty uh, that... that um, we were talking about earlier. Um, I just wondered, um, you know, how often that comes into play. But obviously, it's all um, regarding the intelligence that you have available. It's, it's, it's probably not in the wildlife side of things, but in the domestic animal side, when it's or badger baiting, it's very common because we always rely on the, the help from Police Scotland if we're dealing with a known dangerous person. So we approach them for assistance on the day. As soon as they know who the target person is, they've, that's when you find out that. There have been a client of the police in the past, and it, it all goes from there. Okay. Yeah, just as a very principled point, come back to Mark's question about sentencing guidelines. I think there's no doubt that increased maximum penalties hopefully will inevitably help link to compliance and deterrence and risk and consequence. But fundamentally, I think quite a lot of people struggle with the lack of transparency about sentencing. Uh, and we've heard that both last week and this morning about the, the lack of transparency in some of these things. So if there is sentencing guidance out there which people can better understand, I think that can only be a good thing. Well, I think even reading the papers for, for the committee, you will see, and we've heard from various people given evidence today, the lack of consistency for offences which may well be com relatively comparison in terms of impact that they have. So I think that would help. Up on that, we had a similar problem um, in England where we publish every year a report that shows what local authorities have taken, what offences under animal health and welfare. Um, and we were actually putting the individuals and the sentences that they received. And then for a period of time, we decided no, we'd slim it down, we'd just put that so many offences. In actual fact, we had a call to put the information back in because it was one of the source documents that the the judiciary went to because, so they could actually compare sort of the offences and the sentences given because they are quite infrequent. Given sort of the, the whole sort of what happens within the judiciary system, our sort of offences aren't that frequent to a lot of the other things that are seen day to day. So it was very difficult for them to be able to sort of think, well, where do I get this information? I've got this before me. I've never done one of these before. Mm. What shall I do? Uh -huh. So that has proved sort of in England a, a good source document for at least a, a bit of reference to see if they're where to go to. Finley, you had a question. I, I suppose it, uh, um, I, I just want to be sure that the bill does all the things that we want it to do. Um, and, you know, we've heard of people being prosecuted for illegal razor clam fishing, but they don't get prosecuted for 
carrying out the legal activity because it's too difficult to prove. They get prosecuted for tax evasion or they get prosecuted for health and safety. And, and I think that maybe have been the case when it comes to puppy farming. It's not always the, the issue we're addressing directly. It's, a con it's something else that we get. Or Al Capone getting put to prison for tax evasion rather than gun crime or whatever. Are, are we confident that the bill, as it is just now, has everything in it that will address the real issues that we have? That's absolutely. I think it comes down to the investigative standard and approach. It's always going to be a difficult crime to solve, to prove the individual responsible. And that comes back to how we can shape our investigation to make sure it's the most professional and applied across the board, across the whole of the nation. I think Police Scotland, with the different partners we mentioned, do that. So the bill's fit for purpose in that respect. It's just a case of the difficult investigations at time. And it's not just taking it from day one of the investigation. It's, it's looking at, just as you said, all the different options as well to try and disrupt these individuals responsible. And if we do get them for that minor offence, well, well, we'll actually go after them for it if we can't prove the wider or larger offence. But, um, yeah, the bill's fit for purposes as far as I'm aware. Okay. Any questions? I want to move on to um, asking questions around the rehoming with a court order. Um, I've spoken to Mike in the past about this uh, over that particular uh, incident in my constituency. The impact of this, not having to have a court order in order to rehome or sell on animals, what impact is that, uh, implications is it going to have, first of all, for the welfare of animals and also about um, the local authorities, police, SSPCA as organisations? What is the impact of that that's um, put forward in the bill? start off with that. Yeah. From the Scottish SPCA point of view, this would be a groundbreaking piece of legislation for us. I mean, you've mentioned the two aspects there. The welfare of these animals is totally compromised if they're being kept for up to 23 months waiting in kennels. If a person doesn't voluntarily relinquish an animal, it must, as currently, it must be kept until the determination of the court case. We don't hold on to animals if a report should have gone to the fiscal. Um, it's only when there is an, a pending case. Um, the worst case we've had in recent years is the 23 months I mentioned, where 57 dogs were held for 21 months. Now, if you take the commercial terms, if that had been a police case and they said, look after animals for us, that would have cost the police £440,000. Mm. It's £15 per dog per kennel per day. But the welfare of those animals, we've got the best kennels, we've got the best staff uh, imaginable. That's no place for a dog to get up. The one in your constituency, we had some of the dogs we, we seized were pregnant bitches. So they actually gave birth in our kennels and were over a year old before they'd basically seen the, the light of day. We built new sensory gardens and all these kind of things to try and stimulate some of the experiences they should experience. But a dog at one year old, and all it's ever known really is kennels, is not a good thing for welfare. And uh, given <coughs> that you know, you, you've, you've touched on the cost that there is to the SSPCA in actually um, you know, keeping these animals for that period of time, with this, that is going to release a lot of money for you to do the other work that you're, you're supposed to be doing. Two very important points, sir. We estimate that in just un under two years, it's cost us one and a half million pounds to care for animals that have been involved in court cases. Um, if you go back to the two instances I've mentioned, uh, the two big cases, a year last August, if you'd gone to our Glasgow dog and cat home, which has 160 kennels, we had two dogs for rehoming. Every other kennel had a dog in it waiting to go to court just because of the backlog, well, because of the court system. Charlie. Just about what Mike's saying there, that one of the uh, difficulties in seizing dogs from hair courses is the cost of keeping those dogs. So, yeah, as Mike was saying, we'd support anything that alleviates those costs. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, getting the balance, and this may be a question more for, for Joanne, the balance between safeguarding animal welfare and the rights and the interests of, of the owners of animals. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that? Because you, you did touch on that earlier. You've know, you got a situation where you've maybe got somebody who's got into a situation and they find their animals been seized from them. And I think, um, you, as you say, homing dogs and keeping dogs in kennels is difficult. But when you're faced with, as we do regularly, sort of herds of 80 head of cattle, 
that you can see deteriorating and our vets will go out time and time again um, just to be either putting animals down that they're seeing dying, um, that they, they are sort of powerless, they, they try and work with the, um, the owner to, to sell some of them off, to, for, for him to recoup some money before they become worthless. Um, it's not, it, it is the welfare of the animals and it, it's also um, the welfare of the vets because clearly it, it, it is an emotional um, strain on them when they, they are going out and they know the local authorities um, aren't necessarily resourced to, to take in and look after these animals that do need um, sort of handling every day, they'll need feeding, watering and also finding somewhere to put the animals is, is very difficult, um, especially because we've got disease control measures that we have to make sure we've um, covered before we move them anywhere. Um, so it is a balance, but I think once we've got to that point and you can see that with all the best um, persuasion, cajoling, care notices that, that quite explicitly tell them what people need to do, we'll engage with neighbours, um, the farming ne networks to try and sort of help them before that it gets to that point. I think it does come when you you can see that in actual fact nothing else is going to happen. You have to seize the animals and, and at that point the decision is made that their rights um, have to come over for anybody who just thinks they can farm and do what they like regardless of actually looking after their animals. Three week appeal time, do you think that's appropriate? It's it's too long in terms of the care and the time um, it takes and the cost to the local authority and that's what will deter the local authorities. We've got an example here where there is 80 animals and it was actually a protracted appeal it didn't even happen in three weeks so there was a protracted appeal and the cost to the local authority was phenomenal which they don't get back because usually by this point there is no money um the situation now is too long so yes. the three week is appropriate yes that's sorry yeah. yes yeah it okay. is sorry yes um so it, it and then that's the difficult so once the local authority experiences that they are very reluctant then to take on any more cases and that becomes a catch-22 because sometimes we'll then take them to court um, and they'll say well if it was that bad why did you not seize the animals so then you are caught to say well it was bad but we couldn't seize the animals because it then came down to monetary so it, it is a really city yeah you know actually yeah. looking over it. any other thoughts on 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 those issues um, in terms of the processes that there, there will be in place to ensure that any of the sale rehoming or sadly any kind of euthanizing of animals has taken place as a result of this um, new power to seize animals without a court order. Are you confident that those are all in place? Um, anyone? From our point of view, certainly. Yeah, Finlay. I just wonder whether, you know, we've discussed in other panels about the difference between domestic and commercial working animals, companion animals. Is there, is there potential for difficulties when it comes to how, for example, the SSPC deal with complaints uh, from the public regarding maybe a working dog or a, a domestic dog, because there's probably different levels. You'll get some uh, dogs that, uh, if, you, if the general public was to look at a sheep dog that's uh, been out working in the hill and it's, it looks like it needs a trim and it's a bit muddy and dirty, how do you deal with that? Because that's probably okay, because it's a working dog, but if it's a domestic dog that's used to not being out in the wet and cold and whatever. Is there potential problems when it comes to, to decision making that either the police or SSPCA have to make with regards to the welfare animals working or otherwise? Not really, it's from our side. Uh, the examples you give, a, a perfectly healthy working border collie is a perfectly healthy working border collie. Our guys know what to look for. Any time you're taking a, an offence that, um, the more serious offence of unnecessary suffering is always certified by a veterinary surgeon that the animal has suffered. A, a, a soggy, um, kind of half looking, half knackered looking border collie that's been working all day will not, you'll not get a certificate. It'll be fit as a butcher's pencil in the old term of the thing. So every case is an individual case. Okay. Um, now, yes, Rachel. The uh, time it takes for appeal, um, and there has been evidence to suggest that. Um, the time it's taking and then perhaps an onward appeal um, to the Court of Sessions actually is, is taking too long and I wondered how um, that could be expediated and that would perhaps help the whole process and it's, it's, uh, it's down to the time it's taking within the courts and perhaps there could be a prioritisation of um, 
of some of these cases? Week, yeah, within the three-week period, perhaps if it's rolling over that three-week period um, in terms of the, the time it's taking uh, to uh, deal with the appeal. And then the onward appeal, perhaps, that's, that's, that's moving on to the court of session. Perhaps there could be, um, you know, that should be recognised that there should be prioritisation of certain um, specific cases. I mean, the case, for example, here that Joanne talked about, about um, 80 uh, cows, for example, and, and that, uh, that the suffering that is caused within that period of time. I'm not sure I understand. So, th at the moment, you wouldn't have to have a court order in order to rehome animals or to sell them on. Well, but, it, it's but just it's part of the evidence that we've gathered in in the um, papers that we have that we're saying that, that it's regard to the time it's taking for appeal within the courts. Would anyone like to comment on that? The court process is, um, in my opinion, very underfunded. Uh, you've cut so many sheriff courts over the last couple of years actually getting into court because the Crown Office market for proceedings, then it's over to the Scottish Court Service to actually facilitate the availability of that court. And then you get your alleged accused person coming up saying he can't get legal representation or he's just fired his, his lawyer and delay after delay after delay after delay, in which time animals are being kept at incredible cost to whether it's local authorities, APHA ourselves, and you've got the welfare issues that are involved with that. But with that three-week um, appeal process, that is not going to happen. The welfare issues are going to be dealt with because you're able to That's why move the animals it. on. That's why we welcome this proposal 100%. Yeah. Yeah. OK, we're going to move on to issues of compensation. Stuart Stevenson has some questions um, around that. Yes, I'm going to... If you'll forgive me, just ask a little question on the back of what's just been said. Um, it, the, the whole issue of appeals, it says um, in the, the bill as drafted at the moment, grounds for which an appeal to the court, da 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 da, and there are only three grounds for an appeal, an error of fact, wrong in law, and is unreasonable. And, the, the is un, and this is, has to be lodged within three weeks. The is unreasonable, is that a test that we think is reasonable? <laughs> we would be in a position to be able to defend that because, as I say, we seize animals um, with the support of the veterinary surgeon. So if it went to appeal, we'd be able to provide the appeal sheriff, well, here's the backing, backup reason we've done it. This vet said that this or these animals had suffered or couldn't stay in the uh, situation they were in. Therefore, the reasonableness issue. So, so, so the, the issue of three weeks in which one can appeal a decision, um, the grounds will mean in practice, the only three grounds you can appeal, that it's probably very unlikely there's going to be very many appeals will be successful. That would be my um, estimate. I mean, at the moment, more than half the people we remove animals from will voluntarily relinquish them. Um, other ones, they are informed that this could end up in a civil case. You could be responsible for court. They don't care. It's no cost name anything. A lot of the people that we deal with, they, they want two fingers up to the police in the court anyway. So they're not going to comply with anything. Um, but if they thought, well, wait a minute, I'm going to have to actually take the action here, pay for legal representation, that, I think, would put a lot of them off. No appeal, then we kick into the three weeks and the animals can be disposed of. Um, now to the point, convener, that you wish me to pursue. Um, and I, I just wonder, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole issue is uh, covered at some considerable length in, in the bill, okay, the compensation. Um, do you think that uh, what's in there is fit for purpose? Uh, and in particular, um, colleague uh, Finlay Carson raised the difference between companion animals and animals that are, are owned for commercial purposes. Do we think that uh, the bill strikes the right balance in determining what is the proper compensation that should be granted to the previous owner? Would anyone like to come in? Mike? Um, we've supported this uh, under some criticism. We've uh, been criticised for saying we reckon that the compensation um, provisions available are basically to comply with human rights because um, ourselves anybody is depriving a person of their property it doesn't they don't recognize it as sentient beings you're depriving somebody of their dog their telly whatever um, 
And to comply with that, if that person, in my opinion, is found not guilty, then they would be compensated for the value. But one thing that would be important is the value of the animal at the time it's seized. Because if ourselves or APH uh, sees a herd of cattle and they're worth £50 each, if you wait a year for a court case and they're still only worth £50 each, what's the farmer done wrong? Because they've no improved. Um, so it would be based on the value at the time of seizure. Uh, and, and, and indeed, if there are welfare issues, the value presumably will rise once they move into a regime where their welfare is being cared and issues exactly. addressed. Um, but, but the method of calculating what that compensation is, are you satisfied, <coughs> uh, anyone in the, the room for that matter, that that will be done in a, a proper way? From um, experience, we have been involved in this in the past, um, livestock isn't really an issue. Uh, commercial livestock because you can go to a professional sure. auctioneer valuer who can come in and say those sheep are worth £20,000 and that's the, the value that would sell well, it at about, that time. Well, what about companion animals then? That's where it gets more difficult. Um, if you go into the puppy farming um, aspect, we've been involved and people have been prosecuted where they're selling bulldogs at £2,500 a pup. Um, in reality, they were only worth £200 because of all the genetic defects and all that they had. But the nearest that we've been able to propose would be, if it was French Bulldogs, the maximum compensation we would pay would be the kennel club's average price for a breed of that dog that's in good condition. Well, so, so do forgive me, in a sense, I think we're actually back talking about commercial animals that will become companion animals. But I just wondered, in particular, a private individual who has a companion animal in situ and is deprived of it, should they be compensated in any meaningful way? There is an argument that that animal, the pet animal, would never be, you'd never seize it if it was a perfectly healthy pet that was well loved. So you've got venery evidence that a crime's been committed, so therefore that's a different aspect. There was, I know one kind raised concerns about taking Mrs McGlinty's cat kind of thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there's got to be a provision there. If you, we're going to be putting out a briefing later on. There's a case involving a spaniel called Flo that the, the veterinary um, nurse, qualified veterinary nurse, was poisoning. Um, that took over four years to get to court, and that dog had to sit in kennels for four years. That was horrible for that dog. Sure, but, 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 but this bill provides that that dog can move on in three weeks. Under this bill, but so, no, I still so, stand. So, so, so that's a kind of difference. I'm, I'm on the very, very narrow issue of before we've got the legal process complete, the animal has been removed from its current owner and passed to a new owner, possibly for commercial value, possibly not. Are we satisfied that we can identify the value? Because the whole issue, I mean, the court can decide that the compensation not be given under that, uh, another uh, yeah, 32K. Uh, but, but that would come much later. But at the end of the day, you have to decide at 21 days what that animal, or nearby what that animal is worth. How do we do that for a companion animal? For I think we need to be able to justify to people in the general public who might concerns you. <coughs> Again, we would have to base it on what would be the average price of that animal with consideration of the condition it's in that the vet's saying, that we would say, well, if it, that generally would be worth £100, but the vet's saying it's needing whatever amount of treatment. I mean, when you come down to individual companion animals that are owned by an individual, compensating that person would be quite difficult, not in the financial bit, but out for the emotional. But if they're emotionally attached to it, why are they neglecting it? Well, indeed. Right, we're going to move on to questions from Angus MacDonald and Finn's Law. OK, thanks, um, convener. Uh, with regard to uh, our Scottish Finns Law, we've seen um, broad support in the consultation for, the, uh, for its introduction. Um, and as you'd expect, uh, last week's panel were, were also firmly in support. So um, w would you say that the proposals in the Bill um, for a Scottish Finns Law are an appropriate mechanism for increasing protection for service animals? And also, do you feel that the current law as it stands has acted as a barrier uh, to prosecuting and penalising those responsible for attacking service animals? Would anyone like to give their view? <coughs> um, bringing in Finn's law, um, we've been involved with 
police, police dogs and military dogs for the latter for over 30 years. Um, and the thought of one of them being attacked when it's carrying out its duties to protect the public is just abhorrent to me. Um, it tends to be, I've always been surprised that when a police dog or that is injured, uh, that they've not been charged under the section uh, 19 of the Animal Health and Welfare Act anyway, because kicking a dog is kicking a dog, whether it's a police dog or not. But the, it's just not been dealt with correctly by the courts, mainly in England. It's, it's very rare. I've, there's not a lot of attacks on service animals here, as far as I'm aware. I don't know about my colleagues. Um, I mean, I have heard of instances, but not some of the horrendous ones I've heard down south. I agree. Um, yeah, we've, we've had very minimal, so it's difficult to try and form an opinion because we don't get that much. I mean, I think the last one was when an individual's gone and punched a police force, for instance. So uh, there's nothing, uh, nothing that's come to my attention. I don't know if Charlie, you've heard any difference. Nothing that's come to my attention, but uh, from a personal point of view, I think Finn's law looks good. You know, and applicable. It hasn't Scotland. happened. Doesn't mean to say there shouldn't be things in place. Mm. Angus, do you want to come back in? Yeah, well, it's certainly good to hear that there've been no uh, or, or, or few incidents, but. Uh, in my view, it would certainly be good to, to, to have it in, in black and white. Um, th there was a, a debate last week um, during the panel um, with regard to an argument to broaden the definition uh, of service animals to encompass assistance uh, animals, such as guide dogs. Uh, what's the panel's view on that? Would you agree? Anyone? Tend to agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, why not? I think it'd be good to widen it to that. There's, if anybody's got that ability to go and harm these animals, they need to full force of the law against them. Okay. That's great. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Um, move on to questions now. Um, Mark, did you want to ask anything on Finn's law? Are you quite happy that Angus has covered it all? Um, it, it just depends on time convened. I'll be guided time, by so you on time. Yeah. Okay, uh, Stuart, f um, fixed penalty notices, and just to keep your eye on the clock, please, you hinted. Right. Um, let me just start with a technical one, which there may be no answer to, it may be the, properly for the Minister. Um, the, the, the bit of the bill that covers FPNs is probably is the second biggest part of the bill. Uh, but at the very end of its provision, it says regulations under subsection 1 may modify any enactment, including this Act. Um, and subsection 1 is basically about making provision for fixed penalty notices. I just wonder if anyone thought that was a very, very broad provision. Okay. Right? OK. Yep. In that case... Also, I was just going to say, and I think it needs to be at this point, because we, will, we can't and we wouldn't be using fixed penalty notices for everything you could imagine. And I think it just gives us that ability to work through and figure out which is the appropriate ones to use it for, and potentially then enable us, because we don't know what the future brings, there could be things we've not even thought about now that later down the stage you think, actually, we could deal with it that way. So I think it, it's been open like that to give us the ability to to sort of investigate further and then choose the appropriate ones as a pro where, where we needed okay i'll just make the observation i'm not sure that as drafted it's restricted to animal welfare but that's right can that's we move on to talking about wildlife crime uh, sorry robbie you were just to on the that. point of fixed penalty notices and 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 the, the proposed for the animal health and welfare act but um i think scottish government are now having a very focused consultation on extending some of those powers to offences under the World Country Act, the Deer Scotland Act, the Badger Act. Again, introducing flexibility at both ends of the regulatory spectrum seems to make sense for us. And there are a number of technical fences or administrative type of fences which we feel would probably benefit from fixed penalty notices associated with wildlife as well. OK. And I suppose that's just the question. Do people think it's appropriate to have fixed penalty notices as part of the criminal law? And that's probably yes. it. I think very much so with regards to some of the minor technical offences, which uh, I know it was alluded to in, in the previous session. I mean, fixed penalty notices are not uncommon to police. We use them principally, I've got guns to mind, in road traffic. Uh, so um, there is precedent there. There are other areas in wildlife crime or around, sort of, for example, Marine Scotland, I believe, can you see fixed penalty notices uh, in their line of work. So, yes, I think uh, it would be applicable for wildlife crime. Uh, particularly at the minor end, when one might not be considering necessarily reporting to the Crown Office because of the minor, minor offence, particularly technical ones, but it does give an alternative disposal to officers. 
Moving on to uh, increasing the maximum sentences for wildlife crime, Colin Smith has some questions. Yes. Th thank you, Convener. Uh, in the previous session, um, a number of members of the panel questioned the, the categorisation of certain crimes in the bill. There was a feeling, for example, that a crime that impacted on the resting place of, a, of an animal, such as destroying a badger set, should be categorised as a, as a serious crime. Um, but I'm just keen to get a, a general feeling from the panel on what they think about the rationale in the bill of categorising specific um, crimes. I, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. There, there do remain some inconsistencies, I think, even within what's proposed by tidying these things up. So, uh, but some of it is still linked to the underlying legislation. So for European protected species, it can be a serious crime to disturb or, or, or destroy resting places, but we don't have the same provisions for badgers or for wild birds. Um, so there, is, there are still some questions about the consistency of approach for categorising different types of offences, which are not entirely addressed within the current provision. Any other views from anyone else? Okay, Colin, carry on. I suspect I might get the same answer that Mark got um, on the issue of um, the provisions within the bill. Obviously, Mark asked about um, animal welfare. My question is really about um, wildlife crime, but whether or not the panel believe that the provisions in the bill, such as increased sentences, the extension of the time alone for prosecution, will they impact on the likelihood of bringing a, a prosecution? But I suppose the difference in wildlife crime is, uh, my question is really specifically around vicarious liability, is what's contained in the bill likely to make that a prosecution of vicarious liability more or less likely? Under the vicarious liability provisions uh, in the Wildlife and Countryside Act, any more likely or less likely, uh, as, as I've already alluded to, each case is considered on its own merits, and when, a, when we receive a case, we'll consider whether we can raise a prosecution. Uh, what, what the the ability to prosecute at summary or solemn level opens up is a, a choice of forum that we don't have at the moment. Uh, we're offending to be of a particular uh, level or, or character uh, so as to justify proceedings, say, at sheriff and jury level. Um, that, that's not an, an option that the Crown have to open to them at present. Uh, but the same considerations in terms of uh, has a crime been committed? Is there sufficient admissible evidence? Is a prosecution in the public interest? All the all the same factors that we that inform our decisions about prosecution remain unchanged by the bill. Okay. 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 Um, well, final point is really just to ask the panel how effectively penalties other than custodial sentencing fines are, are currently being used, um, such as payback orders, for example, when it comes to a, a, a wildlife crime. Anyone want to come in that? Can I uh, help out here? <laughs> by, um, I can just answer Colin's question. <laughs> just, just, no, <laughs> no by that, going back to the categorisation well. point, um, yeah. uh, convener. It's just that um, Ross Ewing in the last session, Ross Ewing from Basque, mentioned that illegal use of pesticides could become, for example, a tier one. It's already an offence. So I just wondered if, um, if there was any comment regarding the levels of categorisation, uh, some more detail on that, if the panel had any more detail, if, if it would make um, prosecution easier, if, if that was, um, I suppose, categorised more effectively. Any of our representatives in Police Scotland like to come in on that? Uh, Charlie's probably got more of the expertise to comment on the pesticide use. Yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, we, it's uh, around... You talk about maybe they make prosecutions easier. It comes down to level of evidence, um, so that's the, the, that's what dictates a prosecution at the end of the day. Um, so whether it's pesticide or proving other crime. On that point, um, there is a general feeling from some people that are, that are feeding into the the, 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 the evidence base that that. Ultimately, if a crime is seen as being serious, there's more likely to be a higher sentence. Then it's, it's more effort is going to go into effectively investigating that crime and bringing that forward. Is that not just human nature that if something is a is a is a, is a small fine or a rap in the, the, the knuckles, then given the huge pressure um, on on prosecutors on police in terms of time and resources, that if something is likely to be seen as a more serious crime more effort is going to go into bringing that crime ultimately to the courts and, and getting a prosecution. 
Well, I think certainly it would raise a priority of it. Um, I've argued that the killing of a golden eagle is not a serious crime at the moment because it can only be uh, tribal at summary level. You can't take it to the top two levels uh, in, the, in the country. And you think of the Black Isle case where there were uh, into double figures of red kites and buzzards that are poisons. I'm sure that would have been something that maybe the Crown Office may have considered taking up to a, like to have taken up to a higher level. So yes, without doubt, um, I think the higher the, uh, the, the penalties, then without doubt it, it, it puts us into the serious crime bracket and I think we, take, that we can you know, consider the resources appropriately. Okay, want to move on to sure. questions from... Just yes. one point, back on Colin's point. I do think the increase in the time for a time bar under wildlife crime would be a, a great welcome thing, as opposed to a lot of the domestic um, animal stuff that we bang on a door and the evidence is there. It can take months before any evidence comes uh, to light regarding wildlife crime. So by the time you've got already gone three, four months, by the time you start the investigation, you've run out of time. So I think the potential for a longer time bar would certainly help in wildlife crime. Well, that leads on to questions. Sorry, Charlie, I want to come Yeah, back. I can support that without doubt. Um, and the Parity Report looks for harmonisation across uh, wildlife legislation. And yet when you look at the Animal Health and Welfare Bill and the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act, where your hare coursing and your fox hunting will, will be drop under, it's a six month uh, period in which you have to provide time for the Crown Office to issue proceedings. And if there is video evidence and if there's uh, to be looked through often by a, somebody who's been filming it, then that can take a month before it's reported to the police. You really are cramming in the amount of time for uh, forensic analysis to be undertaken for our own video uh, experts to analyse the evidence available. And to, by today's standards, it's simply, I don't think, appropriate to try and fit all that inside six months, which is why Police Scotland have had cases which have been really squeezed and perhaps haven't had the full benefits of all the evidence being presented to the Crown Office quite simply because they haven't had the time to do it. Now, when you look at the other acts, <coughs> uh, Protection of Badgers, Wildlife and Countryside Act, Habitat Regulations, you've got that three-year time bar, and uh, that is much more sufficient, I think, to be mm -hmm. able to bring prosecutions and for the standardisation across wildlife crime. I think that would be very welcome. That leads nicely on to questions from Mark Ruskell yeah, around um, enforcement and investigations. The, the point there, Convener, about um, filming and, and video evidence, um, I, I mean, I, we're interested to know whether... The, the increase in maximum sentences will actually lead to more authorisation of, of video surveillance um, and, and whether the, the admissibility um, of, of that evidence changes now. Well, certainly, um, it, I think, would allow officers to ask the question um, whether the surveillance can be used. Um, we meet the criteria now of, is it, you know, the, 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 it could go to imprisonment for five years if someone gets found guilty. So we're beginning to start meeting that threshold around the three-year part, although the RIPSA says it needs to have a reasonable expectation that three years is going to be uh, given as a sentence. So it allows certainly officers to ask the question whether they can use surveillance um, for further investigations. Yes. So. Well, it's covert surveillance that we're looking at now, isn't it? So there's two aspects to it, directed surveillance and intrusive surveillance. So we've actually always had an option of putting directed surveillance um, kind of investigative approach into any crime that's been reported. So the new legislation, although it brings it up to five years, that's good. That only brings in intrusive surveillance because that is classified as a serious crime. And directed surveillance is slightly less intrusive into everyone's private lives, so we can justify it more. So that maybe your camera in a set location um, to try and capture aspects. But then the intrusive is a serious crime, which means, as Charlie rightly says, expectation of getting three years. And then we can look at if, and it only has to be, again, going back to a case-by-case -case basis, if we have case-by-case -case basis, we have to justify that these intrusive means are the only way to achieve the outcome of identifying the individual responsible. So it does give us a, a, another investigative strand to the, to the hopeful prosecution of the individuals responsible for this. And it's something like I'm Police Scotland are trying to, again, with the, the education and the number of officers we're coming through now, wildlife crime officers, to make sure they have that awareness and expectation that we can apply for this. So what um, the RSPB have done in the past, you know, if we have that intelligence sharing, it comes back to the intelligence sharing, then that will give us the case to go to our authorising officers in Police Scotland and say these are the reasons why we think it's justified and it's going to pass the, the direction of the surveillance commissioners when looking for a European human rights kind of impact on that. So it's, a, it's really good legislation to allow us a, a suite of options to covert surveillance, not just directed but intrusive. Could, Mark, if you, if you forgive me, could I come in? What do you make of the, the 
the comment in the last panel about someone saying that, you know, that it might, if the police are using this more, it might encourage other people who are not the police, you know, I think the word vigilante was used um, to be using videos to, to, to gather evidence that they, th they think is doing a good thing, but they're actually doing things that are actually um, really impacting on people's privacy. Again, that probably comes back down to my mind. another education process, comes down to our media strategy. There's going to be an awareness that surveillance may be used, um, and you'll maybe have members of the public trying, but th these are all can all be captured as well. And, and we would, I don't agree that you'll get vigilantes going out there doing doing that. Or, you know, it's, it's how we actually deal with that and make sure we try and take the lead. I don't see, at this stage, many covert surveillance applications being <coughs> brought just because I think we should actually look to enhance our intelligence picture first. I know I keep going back to that, but without the intelligence, we can't move to that better investigative standard, to that justification for covert surveillance. So it's about information sharing, identifying those who are responsible, looking at the crime hotspots, and then working on what are the best suite of options, what's the best tactics, and then it's maybe a sit down with the partners to see who can bring what to the table and have a joined up approach. Mark. And does, does this change the, the admissibility um, considerations that the Crown Office would? Would make it's the admissibility right. considerations um, that we still have to uh, consider uh, the law on the admissibility of evidence and apply that law to the facts and circumstances of each case. Okay. Obviously, the the, the bill, as as already had, has been explained, removes the, the the obstacle that's currently in place of so being able to consider the serious crime test, uh, but it doesn't impact in any sense on the law and admissibility of evidence. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, if, could I move on, convener, to um, the powers of the SSPCA then? Um, I, I'm just interested in, in really all the, all the panellists' views about whether you think the current powers of the SSPCA are appropriate, whether they should be extended um, to include uh, wildlife crime, particularly in relation to you know, gathering of, of evidence. I think um, in the example that was highlighted by Ian Thompson in the previous session, uh, it did make sense for the wildlife inspectors to do, so the um, animal, uh, SSPCA inspectors to be able to gather evidence and then, um, then to bring that into the police uh, for further investigation. I know that makes complete sense and I think something like that would, could well be welcomed. If, I think that if the powers are an extension of the animal health and welfare, so in those circumstances the SSPCA inspectors go in onto land for a welfare reason, and then it goes on to um, exercising powers under Wildlife and Countryside Act in order to gain that further evidence, like it was in the example explained. Yes, very much welcomed. The difficulty, I guess, and I'm not sure exactly what is intended when one talks about the powers under uh, the Wildlife and Countryside Act, is if the SSPCA inspectors are also going to be able to enter land under Section 19 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, then it starts causing confusion, I guess, as to who uh, polices wildlife crime and whether the public will become quite confused as to who to report um, crimes to, wildlife crimes to. But certainly, as I say, and, and, uh, as an extension, if you like, of entering land under the Animal Health and Welfare Act. In partnership and everyone's aware of the, the roles. Mike, you have a view on this? This is my version of Groundhog Day. Um, for those <laughs> uh, politicians that are old enough, this started off back in 2010. Uh, and the proposal was that we would assist in any way we can, never to take over from Police Scotland. But there is an anomaly that under Section 19.1 of the Act, we cannot retrieve evidence where we can see an offence has happened, unless there's a live animal there. If there's a live animal, we can deal with it under the 2006 Act and take the evidence from that individual. But, but as I think it was Ian said earlier on, if we're looking up, there's a line of traps, we've got to go away and get the police. Now, the police do a fantastic job. We couldn't do our job without them. But there's a stick and plaster when it comes to wildlife crime. You've got 100 odd officers covering the whole of Scotland who've got shift patterns on that today. Do, and we have had occasions where we've actually been in that situation, phoned the police and there's nobody available. Um, so it is not to take over anything. You've got to remember the Scottish SPCA doesn't prosecute. We gather the evidence, it's the Crown Office that prosecutes. And the evidence you require for a wildlife crime is no different from what you need from a domestic animal crime. Now, if you look at the 
2006 Act, we put in about 90 cases last year. If we weren't doing that job, you'd probably have about six between the local authorities and police for domestic animals. Um, now, I'm not saying we're going to boost up the amount of prosecutions to deal with wildlife crime, but after Rosanna Cunningham made her decision in 2017, we wrote and says the Scottish SPCA will help the Scottish Government and Ministers in any way whatsoever in any form of animal welfare legislation. So our offer still stands. I don't think the current minister had all the background in it. She's not been long in post. Um, but as I say, this is something that's been round the corner quite a few times. It comes back to the information sharing aspect of what you've talked before, though. Uh, I've talked about before in this session, better information sharing and the ability to to work better together. Yeah. And I think there's definitely options there. To take on board all of Mike's points there. I think we just have to maybe have that sidebar now that, that it's been going along for that many years. There are definitely options. Do you know? Can we put a police officer into your team to work with a special investigation? So you bring the powers in, and we just see how that works. And I, I just think there's. There's more discussion around this that I'd like to be privy to as well because there's so many different papers, opinions that have been cast out over the years. It's just to see where we can take it to make sure we have the improvements that are required. Okay, Mark. I mean, it, it, it has been put to us that the SSP might have a, a conflict of interest. Do, do, you, do you, I mean, what, what is that? Do you yeah, recognise that criticism? And the conflict, I understand it, um, that was raised, I think, about 2015, is we do have a policy in the Scottish SPC that we oppose sneering. Um, now, that's based purely on welfare grounds, and it was uh, said, well, if you get the powers, how could you be independent if it's a sneering issue? The police have campaigned about drink driving every year for the last 20 odd years. They, they enforce it on a daily basis. Um, if we go along uh, and there is a snare being set, if it's a perfectly legally set snare, free running, tagged, the whole thing, it is left. That is lawful. We'd be breaking the law by interfering with that. Um, obviously, we've already got bans on self-locking snares and them becoming entangled. So, because our policy says one thing, if the law allows it, the law is above our policy. So, as far as I'm concerned, there is no conflict of interest. If the law says something's allowed, then it's allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Finn, you had a question on this. Yeah, and I'm it, afraid we're going to have to round up. Again, it's enforcement and investigation. To, to have, for the bill to have an increased deterrent effect, what importance does the panel put on uh, increased resources, uh, training and, and raising public awareness? That's extremely important. Um, so if you look at Mike's right saying we've got over just over 100, just short of 110 wildlife crime officers across the country, seven full-time, six part-time wildlife uh, crime, crime liaison officers, and it's up to Police Scotland to ensure they have that highest level of training, uh, and an investigation so that no matter what they're faced with from a wildlife crime perspective, we have that level of confidence um, of the standards and approach to it, which is, is, is only ultimately professional at the end of the day. So um, there's new courses coming in, there's new forensic approaches. I think forensics is key, which sometimes we've missed throughout the years. And, it, and it's how do we develop these forensic strategies to support A, the, the, the officers, and B, we've got forensic services now moving into that area. So when we do have this crime, we'll, we can call them out and get their expertise. So there should be a level of confidence coming back to the panel that we we have got that captured from Police Scotland. There's a, the first course opened opened by Rosanna Cunningham, Cunningham is in January this year, and then it'll be a continual course twice a year. So we can give that level of enhanced training as well as a kind of internet-based training packages for all officers throughout Scotland. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank the panel for all their time today. We are going to suspend briefly to allow them to leave before we continue on with this meeting. Thank you.
Our next item in the agenda is consideration of a petition. PE1758 calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to put an end to greyhound racing in Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. The petition has been referred to the committee by the Public Petitions Committee on the basis of our consideration of the Animals and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Scotland Bill. However, um, as the paper states, the bill has been quite narrowly drafted for two main purposes. He's been making provisions for existing animal and wildlife offences, including how these offences are dealt with, prosecuted or considered in courts, and providing inspectors, constables with additional powers to deal with an animal taken into possession on welfare grounds, regardless of whether or not an offence is taking place. So, although it's been referred to us alongside this bill, it doesn't actually fit in with the scope of the bill. But I'd like to ask members if they get any thoughts on the options for this petition, Mark. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, I recognise that this is an issue of very strong uh, public concern, um, but it's also an issue that's never really had any scrutiny in this parliament, um, despite concerns being raised as part of consideration of the 2006 uh, Animal Health Welfare Act. Um, I think, you know, despite the, the fact there isn't a, an exact fit with the bill that's currently before us, um, we do recognise that the Scottish Government are currently looking at regulations in relation to performance animals. Uh, they haven't indicated whether greyhound racing will be within the scope of that, um, but it's likely that it, that, it, that review might be part of, um, that might include greyhound racing as part of that review. Um, so I think it, it would um, make sense for this committee, as the lead committee with responsibility for animal welfare, uh, to be taking evidence uh, on this petition, to be inviting the petitioners in, um, but also representatives of the greyhound racing industry. And if there are conclusions um, from that evidence session that would help the Scottish Government in terms of addressing issues as part of their regulatory review, or indeed issues that could be passed on to the, 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 the yet-to-be-formed Animal Welfare Commission, um, I think that would be a, a, a solid piece of work. And I, I recognise, convener, that the committee's got an incredible workload ahead of it. Uh, therefore, the opportunities for an extensive inquiry would be very limited. Mm. Um, but I think, nevertheless, I think the, the, the key points, the key issues um, deserve to be raised. I think the petitioners in, in particular deserve to have their point of view um, brought to this parliament. Okay, Colin. Uh, th thanks, Commissioner. I would certainly agree with that. I think the, the, the animal welfare issues around greyhound raising, um, raising are, are ones that have been there for some time, uh, but Parliament really hasn't taken them on board and, and, and discussed them sufficiently uh, to come to any conclusions on this. Um, there are a lot of concerns there at the moment around, around opening greyhounds, uh, about the whole issue of euthanasia, um, the impact that has on, on, on large numbers of dogs requiring to be rehomed. So there's a lot of serious concerns that haven't really been addressed. And I think it would be remiss of Parliament not to give those who are bringing the petition forward the opportunity to put their particular case, and others will have a different view, but to put that particular case to Parliament. And obviously this committee has a, has a remit for uh, animal welfare issues, and it would be an appropriate place to discuss that, notwithstanding, obviously, that the workload issues in, involved in the many other um, issues that the committee has to look at. I still think that, the, the committee, that those bringing the petition forward should be given an opportunity to, to, to lay uh, their views in front of Parliament. Thanks, Lib. I think we're all agreed that it doesn't fit in with this bill as such, but um, <clears throat> the, the point's well made. Excuse me. <clears throat> the point's well made that the petitioners should be able to air their views, and I don't think there's any disagreement on that. And just coming back to the, the Minister has said that um, the programme for government will be introducing reform and licensing of animal activities, including the animal sanctuaries, rehoming centres, breeding, and the use of animals in public display or performance. There's not any specific uh, mention of greyhound racing in the programme for government. However, the point is made that we should give that space for them to put their case so that it could be considered, um, and this is the best place to do that. So, are we agreed that <clears throat> as part of us looking at this licensing, when that happens ahead of that point, that we should allow space in our work programme to have the petitioners in and ask them questions, and petitioners and potentially other uh, stakeholders involved to, to get a full picture of what's involved here? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> that concludes the committee's business in public today. Its next meeting on the 17th of December. The committee expects to hear from the Minister for Rural Affairs and Natural Environment on the Animals and Wildlife Protections, Penalties and Powers Scotland Bill. We'll now move into private session and ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed.